A Family Elopement by H. G. Wells. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Krista Zaleski. A Family Elopement. Your wife does not notice our being together? asked Miss Hawkins. I think not, said Mr. Gabbitas. She is talking to that theosophist. The theosophist was a slender young man from India, but his hair might have come from the Sudan. Mrs. Gabbitas was a lady with intellectual features of a Roman type, and a shallow desire for profundity. She was clearly very much interested in what the Hindu had to say. So Miss Hawkins turned again to Gabbitas. I said I cannot go on like this, said Gabbitas. Speak lower, said Miss Hawkins. I cannot go on like this, dearest, said Gabbitas, trying to put as much tender passion as possible into a hoarse whisper. What can we do? said Miss Hawkins. So much as we dare do. Flight, said Gabbitas. Let us get out of all this into a sunnier clime. Hush! They are coming to ask me to sing, said Miss Hawkins. Presently. Wait. Mr. Gabbitas yielded her up at this crisis with the best grace he could and went and propped himself against a wall where he could watch her profile. "'She is awfully clever,' said the refined young gentleman to the left of him, to his friend. "'And virtuous,' said his friend. "'But that's a mistake. She really ought to do something just a little cheerful, you know. People are not going to run after singers just because they sing, you know.' "'She knows that,' said the refined young gentleman. "'She's clever enough. There will be an exploit.' "'Good heavens!' said Gabbitas under his breath. "'Such motives in my sweet little Minnie! I can't stand this!' And he hastily sought a vacant piece of wall elsewhere. "'It is sweet to be with you again,' he whispered to her presently, with a sense of infinite relief. "'And now, dearest, frankly, will you, dare you, come with me? If you knew, dearest, how I have longed for you, how my soul craves! So,' very loud, I had a very jolly time indeed. The latter inane sentence because somebody had loomed up just behind Miss Hawkins' chair. Gone now, said Gabbitus. Tell me, dearest, quickly, whisper, dare you? Pause. For you, whispered Miss Hawkins very softly, looking down. Gabbitus took that as an affirmative. My darling, my own, the warmth will show. I mean to say, do you find the room hot? What disconcerts you now? I caught Mrs. Gabbitus's eye just then. I think she wants to go home. That theosophist has left her. Now qualified observers state that a man who means to run away from his wife, even if that wife have features Roman rather than beautiful, and a tendency to theosophy, suffers considerable twinges of compunction. Gabbitus certainly did. Even if one's marriage is chiefly a success from the mercenary point of view, a habit of mutual consideration grows insensibly out of the necessity of a common life. It was a very successful affair, dear, he remarked. They had some lovely sandwiches, I noticed. Yes, said Mrs. Gabbitus, turning dreamy eyes upon him. The sandwiches were lovely, and the decorations were lovely, too, and the music. It has been the most lovely evening I can imagine. I'm glad you liked it so much, dear. She smiled mysteriously at him. She seemed to be suddenly affected with an unusual tenderness. Dear husband, she said. What is up now? thought Gabbitus. She is not going to pump me. And he remarked, Yes, dear. You have always been a good husband to me, dear. Rather, said Gabbitus privately and aloud, always. You may kiss me, dear. Gabbitus did as he was bid, and that was all. After this treat, Mrs. Gabbitus relapsed into her corner. She did not suspect then, after all. Gabbitus was greatly relieved. Yet she had never spoken in quite this way before. If she meant to develop sentimentality, a new inducement was added to elopement. And again and again, and yet again, there three times altogether in a fortnight, Mrs. Gabbitus returned to this same peculiar soft mood. One or two things she said startled Gabbitus extremely at the time. However, he kept on accumulating his luggage at his chambers nevertheless, for he was a hard man. She cannot know, he said to himself, following her with his eyes, after one of these conversations. No, if she knew she would make a shindy. 
she would certainly make a shindy. I know her disposition. I suppose she has got this new style from some novel. Poor old Mimsy. As he went by her door, he paused momentarily, for she seemed to be on her knees and weeping by the bedside. That was through looking out of the corner of his eyes. When he looked straight, he saw that she was only packing a dress basket, and he went on downstairs relieved. Five days after the last of these remarkable conversations, Gabbitus found himself on the Southampton platform of Waterloo Station, with a large pile of boxes, masculine and feminine, in his care, and an exhilarating sense of wrongdoing in his heart. Miss Hawkins mingled timidity with self-possession delightfully. This is the end of London and respectability, said Gabbitus. And the beginning of life, dear, said Miss Hawkins. Here is our luggage, said Gabbitus. By the side of their heap was a similar one. A little portmanteau in this caught his eye. It seemed familiar. Is that not mine? he asked the porter. Mrs. Da Costa, read the porter on the label, for Lisbon. No, that is not mine, said Gabbitus. And yet it seemed somehow funny. We should see that our seats have not been taken, I think, dear. At the door of their compartment a man was standing with his back towards them. He was evidently a foreigner. His hair formed a peculiar frizzy mat, such as no Englishman could or would exhibit. As they approached, he turned. There was a pause of mutual inquiry. Mr. Jamasji Ganpat, said Gabbitus. Mr. Ganpat, the eminent theosophist, looked at them stupidly. He seemed scared for a moment, then his face lit up. He raised his hat. Mr. Gabbitus, with Miss Hawkins. Miss Hawkins turned half round to pull a loose thread out of her travelling rug. We are going down to Southampton, said Mr. Gabbitus, collecting his resources, together, to meet Mrs. Gabbitus. Indeed, said Mr. Ganpat, and his eye wandered round to the waiting-room door. He seemed nervous. Do you know, he said, I think I must. I had better— it is unfortunate excuse me he turned his back suddenly and hurried away it was better to recognize him said gabbitus how nervous he seems i wonder if he suspects perhaps he is shocked hello ganpat had not been able to reach the door to the waiting-room in time it opened somebody appeared in a grey travelling dress a flaxen-haired lady with roman features smiling sweetly at him mimsy exclaimed gabbitus with addenda "'Mrs. Gabbitus,' said Miss Hawkins. The smile of Mrs. Gabbitus died away at the sight of Ganpat's alarmed visage. She sought over his shoulder for the cause. "'Oh, my poor George!' she exclaimed faintly. And then she saw Miss Hawkins. "'You!' "'Take your seats,' howled the guard. "'Take your seats, please.' "'I suppose,' said Gabbitus, finding curses sotto voce no comfort, "'under the circumstances we had all better get in together and explain.' and in a minute four singularly depressed and silent people were travelling in a first-class compartment out of Waterloo Station. It was one of those conversations that are difficult to begin. Mrs. Gabbitus broke the silence at Thou Hall. "'This is perfectly ridiculous,' she said abruptly and hotly. "'Idiotic! We can't do anything now!' "'That, dear, is just what I feel,' said Miss Hawkins very slowly, and without looking up, making a new kind of sinuous strip. It will not be even a romantic scandal, said Mrs. Gabbitus, with tears in her voice. Nothing original. It will just be funny, horrible, beastly. The meeting lapsed into silence. I do not know, said Mr. Ganpat, with a half-laugh. What? It is funny. Again meditation reigned. Beyond Clapham, Gabbitus cleared his throat. Yes, said Mrs. Gabbitus. We have, said Gabbitus, got into this mess and we have to get out of it. I and Ganpat might fight. No, said Ganpat, ladies present, no fight. We might fight, said Gabbitus, but I do not see exactly what we should be fighting for. Precisely, said Ganpat, nothing worth fighting for. He smiled reassuringly at Mrs. Gabbitus. The reputations of the ladies must not suffer, said Gabbitus. Again, precisely, said Ganpat, becoming animated. And now you hear me. Now I will tell you. What will we do? Here is Mrs. Gabbitus and Mrs. Hawkins. They go. They go with us to Southampton. Quite proper that, eh? Hear me to my final end. Then we part. I and you, Mr. Gabbitus, I and you go to Paris. Is that not well? 
it is an excursion that we have planned you my i mean madame you madame go with miss hawkins you go to go to lisbon will be far enough as the things are labelled yes said miss hawkins taking her strips and tearing them transversely into squares it's sensible i'm sure i don't mind now that is admirable what do you say gabbitus the eye of gabbitus rested on miss hawkins for a moment this is a beastly mess he said miss hawkins glanced up and he fancied she nodded imperceptibly he turned to ganpat very well that will do we have all been very silly said mrs gabbitus idiots in fact as far as i can see said her husband nobody can throw stones there is no injured innocence in this carriage at all said mr jamassy ganpat and now said mrs gabbitus everything being settled let us talk of something else ringlets said miss hawkins making her paper scraps into two heaps in her lap ringlets dear are coming into fashion after all end of a family elopement by h g wells how gabriel became thompson by h g wells this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. read by krista zaleski how gabriel became thompson after the pact matrimonial there are nine possible events all post matrimonial stories belong to one or other of these nine classes indicated by these possibilities the characters the accessories may vary indefinitely but the tale is always to be classified under one of these heads for each party to the marriage says one of these three things first it is not as i expected but it will do very well contentment secondly it is not as i expected but we must manage compromise or lastly it is not as i expected and i will not endure it catastrophe the permutations of these three formulae taken two at a time are nine forming the diapason of marriage now the best stories as stories are to be made by taking number three in its five possible combinations and solving your situation by the method of murder or elopement number one with itself gives only a nauseating spectacle of married people kissing in company number two alone or with one affords no vivid sensations stories on these lines are but sunset pieces at best the young people go hither and thither buying furniture receiving and returning cards and the like while the clouds of glory they trailed after them from the romantic time fade by imperceptible degrees at last they look round and remark or do not remark that the light is out of the sky and the world blue and cold the change indeed is sometimes so steady and so gradual that i doubt if some of them ever know the extent of their loss but what a splendid time is that of the pre-matrimonial flights before the ephemeris of the human imagination accomplishes its destiny how the world glows only the untried know the infinite strength of the untried there are innumerable things to be and no one has done them the tale of those who have failed and died has no meaning in our ears what ambitious student has not sat and talked with his sympathetic friend lending and borrowing ears in a fair commerce of boasting of the great deeds germinating this boasting of the future is the cement of all youthful friendships as boasting of the past is of those of age but the former have a divine warmth of nature which the latter lack gabriel my own friend was a splendid exemplification of this romance period of life gabriel thompson was his name but at first it was jester to call him gabriel for he had golden hair that flowed over his collar and a beardless angelic face his soul was full of love of great deeds and justice and our common conversation was the entire reform by a few simple expedients of human society later however it became necessary to call him thompson that will explain the title it is a story of compromise of the clipping or shedding of the archangelic pinions by which he soared i remember the evening when gabriel told me he was in love we had discoursed of the mystical woman soul that sways men gabriel with divine warmth and i in colder strain 
indeed as regards that particular fire i have always been a bit of salamander presently however gabriel swooped down to the concrete i felt more than one twinge of jealousy as he rushed into details with a transient nervousness of manner unusual to him he gave no names or dates is she beautiful i said perceiving he raved little in that direction her features are not regularly beautiful plain oh dear no indeed she has the greatest of all beauty the beauty of expression you need to talk to her a kind of upward adoring look i thought is she cultured she has read very few books and yet she had a most wonderful insight into things several times as i have been timidly feeling my way to this or that advanced view of ours she has come out to meet me as it were and i found that in the seclusion of her quiet country town she had thought out things and arrived at the very same ends as we with all our advantages have done she must be quick-witted she is indeed a more subtle and yet purer mind i never met i am giving her some of ruskin's books now he is a revelation to her she says she finds so much in him that has been in her own mind dimly perfectly expressed carlyle she must read after that wordsworth browning and so he went on she was quite womanly gabriel was very insistent upon that she entirely agreed with him that a woman's sphere was her home she did not want votes at that time he was smarting a little from a controversy with miss gowland m b who did this wonderful girl was quite content to accompany his song so he was assured to be the complement of his existence his good angel and his armour-bearer in that fight for the writing of the world which his soul craved after he was to be her teacher servant as a king is the servant of his people and true knight i felt more and more jealous scarcely two months before we had agreed that a new reformation was needed and i was cast in the role of erasmus and gabriel as luther this arrangement arrived at over our youthful pipe solemnly enough was all forgotten now my share was to hear of this absolutely new manifestation of the feminine i was interested only in her imperfections as they showed dimly through gabrielle's panegyric for once gabriel with his bright face his shining eyes his rhetorical gestures and his buoyant flow of words absolutely bored and pained me i cared for him a lot at that time and had promised myself a creditable career by his side i had indeed forgotten the feminine until gabriel remembered it perhaps that evening or at any rate some evening about that time two other friends discussed the same love affair of gabriel's i think gabriel is a pretty name dear said one now dearest said the other holding up one dainty finger with an air of great solemnity i want you to tell me just exactly what you think of him he has a lovely profile you must make him grow a moustache and cut his hair you want to say and dare not minnie you have no moral courage yes he does look a little effeminate now but he is awfully clever he writes you know and he sends me such dreadfully difficult books to read i am getting quite learned it must be jolly to have a really clever husband one that is well known and has people running after his autograph and all that you will be cutting poor me sunk to the besotted condition of a wine merchant's wife dead you shall always come to see me dear on my domestic days but really minnie i am going to be dreadfully happy you know gabriel is going to do all kinds of scientific researches and i shall help him copy his things out and put his experiments out for him and all that i shall make him be an f r s and he will give performances at soirees like that handsome man we saw who did something clever in a bottle gabriel's shadow would look splendid in profile on a white screen isn't he a socialist or anarchist or something all young men with anything in them are like that now it is a kind of intellectual measles dear i don't think any the worse of a young man for that it is like his smoking pipes instead of cigars or cigarettes and not wearing gloves you must see gabriel after i have polished him for a year yes said minnie this is a woman's work we cut and polish these rough diamonds and they take all the credit for the flash and sparkle but if it were not for us there would be no gentleman in the world oh gabriel dear is naturally a gentleman unpolished dear as you admit well so they talked sitting cosily in dainty chairs 
Long before the marriage, this little Delilah of his cut his hair. He came to me less frequently, and one evening he explained that he thought he was clearer-headed when he smoked less. Besides which, the smell of tobacco hung about one so much. Thereafter he ceased to be Gabriel to me, and became Gabriel Thompson. And one memorable day, I had a kind of phantasm of the living, a vision of a fair-haired man with a beeswaxed moustache, dressed in an ample frock coat and light gloves. It was my prophet, curled and scented. The vision fluttered between me and my bookshelves for a moment and vanished, and I knew at once that my Gabriel, the world mender, was lost to me forever. Soon after came the visiting cards of the happy pair. I understand that the correct thing to do is to call upon your newly married friends when they are settled, and see what kind of furniture they have. I did this. By way of quiet sarcasm, I wore my old velveteen jacket. Mrs. Thompson said I looked quite bohemian, and the only consolation I had was to think that Thompson had a conscience. I asked him point-blank about the new Reformation, and she answered for him that he was dreadfully busy at research. I saw Thompson look across at me with a dumb request not to press the matter. But I had no particular kindness for Thompson. Was he not the man who had murdered my prophet Gabriel and buried him away in himself? I insisted upon social evils, the need of leaders for the people, and all our old themes. Presently my Gabriel awoke in Thompson again and began to talk. There is a passage, he said presently, in Sesame and Lilies. The book you liked so much, dear. How does it go? I'm sure you know it. Ah, here is the book. It lay on the table, one of the many volumes he had bought for her. One, I remembered, that had come like a revelation to her. He took it up and turned over the pages. When I saw the pages were all uncut, I felt sorry for the man. He stared at the book as though he hardly grasped the import of the thing. Then he put it down again with force and an expletive. Gabriel, said the wife. I rose to go, but Gabriel was white with anger. You never opened the book, he said to his wife, and you told me you had read it. Mrs. Thompson turned to me. Must you go, she asked. So I left them face to face with each other. It was what one might call their real introduction to one another. Each had played to the other of being what the other dreamt, and now that little comedy was over. Mrs. Thompson had repeated Gabriel's conclusions after him to please him, and he had acted as a gentleman according to her lights. But that unfortunate book had ended it. As I went out, I heard her begin. To think, Gabriel, that in the second month of our marriage you should curse me. And he, why did you only pretend to read my book? I suppose she did it to please him. But I do not know if she made this excuse. It is for a womanly woman a perfectly adequate excuse for any little duplicity she commits. I fancy there must have been a long discussion that afternoon. Practically it amounted to this, that each had married a stranger in mistake for an imaginary person. Such a complication, though common enough, requires very deliberate consideration, amid considerable mutual forbearance. On the contrary, their talk that afternoon was heated, and it ended with domestic thunder, which is the slamming of doors. Mrs. Thompson was calm and reasonable throughout, but Gabrielle did a deal of walking to and fro, throwing books with violence onto the floor, and invective generally. He had imagined that his marriage was to be an idyllic episode, from which he was to return presently to his dream of a new reformation. Gabrielle well to the fore, wife-inspiring, helpful, and advisatory. He felt himself cut off from all this at once, and first he tried to vent his dismay and displeasure on his wife and being defeated by her polite coolness, he took it out on the books, the carpet, and the front door. She was dreadfully pained at his temper and unreasonableness, and annoyed more particularly at his letting the servants hear the quarrel. She could not help asking herself what they would say. Moreover, she was afraid he might do something rash or ridiculous, so that she decided to talk the matter over with Minnie, who was now a wine merchant's wife. I told him he could hardly expect me to read all the books he inundated the house with, especially when I had all my things to see to, and he simply raved. He went on dreadfully, dear, swore at me and insulted me, asked me if I thought was fair treatment towards a man with a mission in the world to marry him under false pretenses. I said there were no false pretenses except that he had behaved like a gentleman, 
and that when I trusted myself in his hands I thought he would always do so. He almost cried when he said that he had looked to me to be his help and inspiration, just as if he had been going abroad as a missionary or something of that kind. I do think that kind of talk silly. If I had behaved really badly to him, Minnie, he could not have been worse. All this ranting and bother because I did not read his silly old books. Rather than have this scene, dear, I would have read every one from cover to cover. You can't think how I have reproached myself for not cutting those leaves. So, Mrs. Thompson. Minnie judiciously heard her through two or three times before she attempted any consolation or advice. He is certainly going on badly, my dear, but we all have our troubles. It is quite enough to make you really ill. I should have been if I had not kept so cool. You bear up wonderfully. He does not deserve it. Of course, dear, if you were ill, when he comes home again, really ill, I mean, not just a headache, so that all the house would be hushed, he might have the grace to feel ashamed of himself. You are too brave. It only makes a man rave worse than ever to stand up to him. They all hate to be told the truth about themselves, and they shout and bully you down. But your Gabriel, any real man, would not hit a really sick woman. It is almost a pity I am so well, then, said Mrs. Thompson, scarcely grasping the new idea yet. It's the excitement, you poor dear, said Minnie. That keeps you up now, but you will find the reaction presently, mark my words. And, sure enough, Mrs. Thompson had hardly reached home when this reaction came upon her, and she was helped upstairs by the sympathetic and half-confidential parlour-maid, and all the blinds were straight away drawn and the house hushed. Meanwhile Gabriel had been with me. "'Don't speak about it to me,' I said. "'I will not be the man to come between husband and wife, especially when the wife is Mrs. Thompson.' "'For heaven's sake, don't mock me,' said Gabriel. "'I have been cruelly deceived.' Here I am at five-and-twenty with all my card-castles in a heap. It is not only that about sesame and lilies. I have been finding her out since the marriage. That book, with you there, was the last straw. She is no helpmeet for me. Her ideas are shallow and vain. Her ways are always crooked. She is just a commonplace woman of the world. What can a man do for others? What can he do for himself with a woman like that? So he raved. I did not join him but I must own my silence was sympathetic. Presently, however, after a pause, he started to his feet and flung his chair headlong. I will not endure it, he shouted, repeating, as the attentive reader will notice, Formula 3. Why should the error of three months dwarf and ruin a life? I will not live with her. I will go abroad. What are these customs and ceremonies, these flimsy ordinances, that they should chain me back from all my possibilities? I tell you I will part from her. I never married her. I married my ideal, and she is no ideal of mine. He caught up his hat in his hand. He stood splendid, almost heroic, holding his right hand for mine. Gabriel, I said to him, calling him by that name for the last time. You have had a bitter disappointment. I cannot advise you. The law of matrimony, like the law of gravitation, no respectable man disputes. Whatever you do, may you fare well. No cat and dog compromise for me, said Gabriel, and so went out right valiantly with my secret blessing. He noticed the blinds in the front of the house were all down, but being a man he did not grasp the full symbolism of this. He knocked for admission, a firm clear knock. Mrs. Thompson at that moment was upstairs hurriedly putting away her bonnet, which she had thought of happily in time. The parlour maid let him in noiselessly, with a funereal expression of face. This startled him, for she was a flourishing, noisy sort of girl. "'Please, sir,' she said in a whisper, holding out his bath slippers, "'do you mind putting these on? Mrs. is very ill indeed.' "'Why, what is the matter?' asked Gabriel in his natural voice, trying to keep up his militant front. "'She regular broke down, sir, after you left her,' said the parlour-maid reproachfully, in an almost noiseless whisper, and therewith handing him the slippers she glided away, leaving him to his conscience." Needless to say, she did not mention Mrs. Thompson's visit to Minnie. Gabriel stood in confused thought for a minute, and then sat down on one of the hall chairs and quietly changed his boots. He had not expected this. He sat meditating vaguely over his discarded boots for some time. He would have to postpone his climax after all. Nuisance. Then his chivalry began to awake. 
perhaps he had been hitting unnecessarily hard she was only a weak woman and he had come home to do battle and finish with her as if she were a dragon certainly his ways were violent she had seemed cool enough during their quarrel but then women he had read are clever at hiding their pain though the dart nevertheless may have gone well home what if she really cared for him he remembered all the wrath sorrow and bitterness of his denunciation had he been heedlessly carried away presently he rose and stole upstairs he would look at her it was a fatal resolution his wife was lying dressed upon the bed in the darkened room her pale cheeks were wet and her eyes were closed so that the damp long lashes lay upon her cheek her hair which was abundant and beautiful indeed her chief beauty was down in one hand she held her smelling salts and the other lay limp and extended there was an expression of pain on her face she seemed to have cried herself to sleep gabriel could hardly realize that this sorrowful little figure was the human being he had raged against ten minutes ago there came over my gabriel i suppose a great wave of generous emotion i admit though it worked to my hurt that there was some greatness in his forgetting his world mending at that moment had he not held her in his arms had not she trusted the happiness of her life to him he was not one of those intellectual prigs who pass their dearest through the fire for some moloch of an idea he had thought his career was to be stifled by his wife he had not realized how his assertion of this would break her down poor little girl with the dishevelled hair poor little sissy the new reformation receded through an illimitable perspective to the smallest speck she sighed in her sleep oh gabriel she said with a sob in her voice gabriel could scarcely imagine why he had just been so angry she was dreaming of him the new reformation vanished he knelt by the bed full of self-reproach and took her hand her eyes slowly opened she looked in his face and saw she had conquered i have been a brute he said this emancipator of his sex gabriel she whispered faintly gabriel dear and closed her eyes again i have been a brute repeated gabriel gabriel she said promise me something anything dear said gabriel promise me you will never speak to that horrid man again now the horrid man referred to was myself and will you believe it dear reader gabriel who had left my home scarcely ten minutes vowing he would do or die promised this is the plain and simple story of how gabriel became thompson so that there was no gabriel any more for me i and the new reformation were buried under the foundation stone of their compromise and there was in spite of gabriel's repetition of formula three no catastrophe from that day to this thompson and i have met and crossed one another in highways and byways but never a word has passed between us after my first rebuff but i understand through a friend and it is a curious example of the metaboly of memory that thompson is under the impression that i incited him to desert his wife the health of mrs thompson is and has been very uncertain since that day it had been a tactical necessity thompson has to be gentle and careful in all his doings he takes her to church regularly and they have a prominent pew and he keeps all the observances however the scientific research languished somehow and he is not a fellow of the royal society yet though it led to several profitable patents he has one of the best houses on putney hill and mrs thompson bears up bravely against her uncertain health and gives really very brilliant garden parties she has dropped many because she is deceitful and lives in one of the smaller houses in the upper richmond road thompson is said to be apathetic in society and irritable in business his health has been poor lately through an excessive consumption of cigars end of how gabriel became thompson by h g wells how pingwill was routed by h g wells this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by krista zaleski how pingwill was routed pingwill was a nuisance he married a respectable young woman of mature years and lives on her sufficiency 
he goes about pretending to be a literary character on the strength of an edition of a classic an examination success at some university place or other and occasional reviewing he likes to talk about books and is offensively familiar with all the masterpieces and most of the rest of english literature he considers gabble about books intellectual conversation he regards a quiet man smoking in a chair as fair game for his scraps of quotation which he is as eager to void as he is greedy to acquire and he cannot understand that people who write books never read them and are full of bitter memories of their own adventures in authorship he wears a pince-nez and mrs pingwell when present echoes all his quavering severities with the explanation that george is so satirical he is exasperatingly reliable in the matter of names and dates and at first perhaps we made the mistake of encouraging pingwell haydinger was the chief encourager of pingwell he is a humorist a kind of person who sees jokes in things that rouse the passions of ordinary people and he found an unaccountable pleasure in developing one particular aspect of the pingwell constitution no retired port butcher's lady no wife of a village rector who has married beneath him could be more punctilious of her intimacy with pingwell among his authors and pingwell was just as intently sensitive to the breadth of scandal which in matters literary is called criticism no one could be thicker with a really chic author no one readier to cut the writer who fell under the shadow of adverse comment he was in fact a literary snob a by no means rare variety and he had an almost passionate dread of admiring the wrong man he took reviews in the weeklies quite seriously naturally he had nothing but serene contempt for dickens and jerome and mark twain and people of that stamp and haydinger never tired of drawing him out upon kipling in a careless moment he had informed us that kipling's style was rough and unfinished it seems he tried for once to form a judgment for himself and had happened upon really quite vulgar and coarse expressions after he had learned better from a review the mere name filled him with uncomfortable memories it was as if the rector's wife had cut the duchess by mistake horrible then he was privately in great trouble about Besant and Hall Caine. Ought I to know them? was the attitude. The oracles differed. He was deliciously guarded upon these authors under Haydinger's most searching questions, but his face flushed guiltily. The Gallien, Zangwill, and most of the younger men who have warm friends and animated critics bothered him more or less, and he had a horrible dread i know that ruskin whom he had committed himself to admire was not quite all that he should be one has to be so very particular was pingwell's attitude however after a while we tired of this creature's odd way with books and his proximity then became as i said a nuisance but haydinger who had formed an adequate conception of his character suggested the remedy and together we routed him both haydinger and i had gone through a morning's work and in he came fresh and freshly primed he dropped into a chair and emitted some indifferent remarks i have heard he said that these delicious child sketches of kenneth graham's are out in a book by themselves read em said haydinger brutally no hardly yet said pingwell but they're good aren't they very said i but that's no reason why you should go about calling them delicious before you have read them perhaps not said pingwell perhaps not they remind me very much of wendell hooper said haydinger you know him bellows intimately i said i have one of his first editions at home you will be reminded very much of wendell hooper said haydinger turning to pingwell indeed said pingwell stepping into the trap the same subtle suggestiveness of phrase said haydinger the same delicate yet penetrating sympathy i must certainly read them said pingwell evidently searching his mind for the name of wendell hooper and flushing slightly i know of no man said haydinger except perhaps lant who comes so near to hooper as graham you know lant's style pingwell pingwell flushed a little deeper and his ears grew pink i can't say said he that i've read he's not so well known as hooper i admitted he was in the little set that clustered round leigh hunt pingwell suddenly felt hotter again I think Leigh Hunt, he began, evidently ready with a fragment of textbook. 
He borrowed from Lant, interrupted Haydinger. Certainly he borrowed from Lant. That essay on the chimney-pot hat. Pure Lant, I said. I've neglected Lant a little, I'm afraid, mumbled Pingwill, horribly bothered by this unknown name. You should read him, said I. He's a perfect mine of good things. That passage in Browning, for instance. You were pointing out the resemblance only this morning, Haydinger. About the chattering discs, said Haydinger. You remember that, Pingwill? I think so, said Pingwill. Chattering discs? I seem to recollect. How does it go? The chattering discs go reeling, said Haydinger, inventing boldly. You must remember. Pingwill now was really very uncomfortable, but he was having a lively lesson in priggish conversation. I wish I had my land here, said I. You surely remember about the chattering discs, said Haydinger, turning as he pretended to search for a book on the shelf. The phrase is quite familiar to me, said Pingwill, but for the life of me I can't recall the context. It's queer what tricks one's memory plays. Haydinger quietly resumed his seat. Have you written anything lately? said Pingwill to change the subject. Yes, said Haydinger, and seeing some further question threatened, added as if in explanation. Alvarado's. It pulled Pingwill up abruptly. Alvarado's. Ah, he repeated after Haydinger, with an air of comprehension. If he understood, he was certainly wiser than I. His ears were now bright red. We remained tranquil, watching him. It was not my affair. He returned to conversation presently with an air of having found and grasped the thing firmly. Will you make them into a book, he said bravely. A just perceptible doom was on his face. Haydinger evidently expected as much. Them, he answered. What? Well, it. Alvarado's. It, said Herr Dinger, raising his eyebrows. I don't know, he said, and became silent. Pingwell was evidently baffled. Very awkwardly, and after a pause, he said he hoped that would be the case. Haydinger thanked him dryly. There was an interval while we watched one another. Then he discovered his pipe was out. It always is, and asked me for the matches. He talked incoherently about indifferent topics for a few minutes after that, and all the time I could see the trouble in his eyes, the awful doubt of his own omniscience that had arisen. Alvarado's. Presently he rose to go, routed. As he went out, I heard him whisper to himself very softly, Alvarado's. He has not been near us since. I can imagine the dismal times he has had hunting through Rabelais, Gil Blas, Hudibras, the Dictionary of Phrase and Fable for Alvarado's, going through the British Museum catalogue for Wendell Hooper, and hunting all Browning for the chattering discs, feeling most horribly ashamed of himself all the time. I like to think of his flush of shame, the overthrow of his frail apparatus of knowledge, and ever and again Haydinger and I break the friendly silences which constitute our intercourse by saying casually, Pingwell seems to be dropping us all together, or don't seem to see so much of Pingwell as we used to, Bellows. Such reflections are the olives of life. End of How Pingwell Was Routed Le Marie Terrible by H. G. Wells this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Krista Zaleski. You are always so sympathetic, she said, and added reflectively, and one can talk of one's troubles to you without any nonsense. I wondered dimly if she meant that as a challenge. I helped myself to a biscuit thing that looked neither poisonous nor sandy. "'You are one of the most puzzling human beings I ever met,' I said. "'A perfectly safe remark to any woman, under any circumstances.' "'Do you find me so hard to understand?' she said. "'You are dreadfully complex.' I bit at the biscuit thing, and found it full of a kind of creamy bird lime. "'I wonder why women will arrange these unpleasant surprises for me. I sickened of sweets twenty years ago.' "'How so?' she was saying, and smiling her most brilliant smile. I have no doubt she thought we were talking rather nicely. Oh, said I, and waved the cream biscuit thing, you challenge me to dissect you. Well? And that is precisely what I cannot do. I'm afraid you are very satirical, she said, with a touch of disappointment. 
She is always saying that when our conversation has become absolutely idiotic, as it invariably does. I felt an inevitable desire to quote bogus Latin to her. It seemed the very language for her. Malorum fiducia par quasque lebet, I said in a low voice, looking meaningfully into her eyes. Ah, she said, coloring a little and turning to pour hot water into the teapot, looking very prettily at me over her arm as she did so. That is one of the truest things that has ever been said of sympathy, I remarked. Don't you think so? Sympathy, she said, is a very wonderful thing, a very precious thing. You speak, said I, with a cough behind my hand, as though you knew what it was to be lonely. There is solitude even in a crowd, she said, and looked round at the six other people, three discreet pairs who were in the room. I, too, I was beginning, but Hope Dangle came with a teacup and seemed inclined to linger. He belongs to the nice-boy class, and gives himself ridiculous airs of familiarity with grown-up people. Then the Giffins went. Do you know, I always take such an interest in your work, she was saying to me, when her husband, confound him, came into the room. He was a violent discord. He wore a short brown jacket and carpet slippers, and three of his waistcoat buttons were, as usual, undone. Got any tea left, Millie? he said, and came and sat down in the armchair beside the table. "'How do, Delalune?' he said to the man in the corner. "'Damn hot, Bellows,' he remarked to me, subsiding crinkly. She poured some more hot water into the teapot. "'Why must charming married women always have these husbands?' It "'Is very hot,' I said. There was a perceptible pause. He was one of those rather adipose people who are not disconcerted by conversational gaps. "'Are you working, too?' "'Working at Argonne,' he said. "'He is some kind of chemical investigator, I know.' He began at once to explain the most horribly complex things about elements to me. She gave him his tea and rose, and went and talked to the other people about autotypes. Yes, I said, not hearing what he was saying. No would be more appropriate, he said. You are absent-minded, Bellows. Not in love, I hope, at your age. Really, I'm not thirty, but a certain perceptible thinness in my hair may account for his invariably regarding me as a contemporary. But he should understand that nowadays the beginnings of baldness merely mark the virile epoch. I say, Milly, he said out loud across the room, you haven't been collecting bellows here, have you? She looked round startled, and I saw a pained look come into her eyes. For the bazaar, she said, not yet, dear. It seemed to me that she shot a glance of entreaty at him. Then she turned to the others again. My wife, he said, has two distinctive traits. She is a born poetess and a born collector. I ought to warn you. I did not know, said I, that she rhymed. I was speaking more of the imaginative quality, the temperament that finds a splendor in the grass, a glory in the flower, that clothes the whole world in a vestiture of interpretation. Indeed, I said. I felt she was watching us anxiously. He could not, of course, suspect. But I was relieved to fancy he was simply talking nonsense. The magnificent figures of heroic, worshipful, and mysterious womanhood naturally appeal to her. Cleopatra, Messalina, Beatrice, the Madonna, and so forth. And she is writing. No, she is acting. That is the real poetry of women and children. A platonic Cleopatra of infinite variety, spotless reputation, and a large following. Her make-believe is wonderful. She would use Falstaff for Romeo without a twinge if no one else was at hand. She could exert herself to break the heart of a soldier, I assure you, Bellows. I heard her dress rustle behind me. I want some more tea, he said to her. You misunderstood me about the collecting, Milly. What were you saying about Cleopatra, she said, trying, I think, to look sternly at him. Scandal, he said. But about the collecting, Bellows. You must come to this bazaar, she interrupted. I shall be delighted, I said boldly. Where is it and when? About this collecting, he began. It is in the aid of that delightful orphanage at Wimblingham, she explained, and gave me an animated account of the charity. He emptied his second cup of tea. May I have a third cup, he said. The two girls signaled departure, and her attention was distracted. She collects, and I will confess she does it with extraordinary skill. The surreptitious addresses. John, she said over her shoulder, I wish you would tell Miss Smithers all those interesting things about Argonne. He gulped down his third cup and rose with the easy obedience of the trained husband. Presently she returned to the tea-things. "'Cannot I fill your cup?' she asked. 
I really hope John was not telling you his queer notions about me. He says the most remarkable things. Quite lately he has got it into his head that he has a formula for my character. I wish I had, I said with a sigh. And he goes about explaining me to people, as though I was a mechanism. Scalp collector, I think is the favourite phrase. Did he tell you? Don't you think it perfectly horrid of him? But he doesn't understand you, I said, not grasping his meaning quite at the minute. She sighed. You have, I said with infinite meaning, my sincere sympathy. I hesitated. My whole sympathy. Thank you so much, she said, quite as meaningly. I rose forthwith, and we clasped hands like souls who strike a compact. Yet thinking over what he said afterwards, I was troubled by a fancy that there was the faintest suggestion of a smile of triumph about her lips and mouth. Possibly it was only an honourable pride. I suppose he has poisoned my mind a little. Of course, I should not like to think of myself as one of a fortuitously selected multitude strung neatly together, if one may use the vulgar rhythm, on a piece of string, a stringful like a boy's string of chestnuts. Nice old gentlemen, nice boys, sympathetic and humorous men of thirty, kind fellows, gifted dreamers, and dashing blades, all trailing after her. It is confoundedly bad form of him, anyhow, to guy her visitors. She certainly took it like a saint. Of course I shall see her again soon, and we shall talk to one another about one another. Something or other cropped up and prevented my going there on her last Tuesday. End of Le Marie Terrible by H. G. Wells The Reconciliation by H. G. Wells This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Krista Zaleski. The Reconciliation Temple had scarcely been with Findlay five minutes before he felt his old resentments, and the memory of that unforgettable wrong growing vivid again. But with the infatuation of his good resolution still upon him, he maintained the air of sham reconciliation that Findlay had welcomed so eagerly. They talked of this and that, carefully avoiding the matter of the separation. Temple at first spoke chiefly of his travels. He stood between the cabinet of minerals and the fireplace, his whisky on the mantelboard, while Findlay sat with his chair pushed back from his writing-desk, on which were scattered the dozen little skulls of hedgehogs and shrew-mice upon which he had been working. Temple's eye fell upon them, and abruptly brought his mind round from the topic of West Africa. "'And you,' said Temple, "'well, I have been wandering. I suppose you have been going on steadily.' drumming along said findlay to the royal society and fame and all the things we used to dream about how long is it five years since our student days temple glanced round the room and his eye rested for a moment on a round greyish drab object that lay in the corner near the door the same old fat books and folios only more of them the same smell of old bones and a dissection is it the same one in the window fame is your mistress fame said findlay but it's hardly fame. The herd outside, say, eminence in comparative anatomy. Evidence in comparative anatomy. No marrying. No avarice. None, said Findlay, glancing askance at him. I suppose it's the happiest way of living. But it wouldn't be the thing for me. Excitement. But, I say, his eye had fallen again on that fungoid shape of drabbish grey. There's a limit to scientific inhumanity. You really mustn't keep your door open with a human brain pan. He went across the room as he spoke and picked the thing up. Brain pan, said Findlay. Oh, that. Man alive, that's not a brain pan. Where's your science? No, I see it's not, said Temple, carrying the object in his hand as he came back to his former position and scrutinizing it curiously. But what the devil is it? Don't you know, said Findlay. The thing was about thrice the size of a man's hand like a rough watch-pocket of thick bone. Findlay laughed almost naturally. You have a bad memory. It's a whale's ear-bone. Of course, said Temple, his appearance of interest vanishing. The bulla of a whale. I've forgotten a lot of these things. He half turned, and put the thing on the top of the cabinet beside Findlay's dumbbells. If you are serious in your music-hall proposal, he said, reverting to a jovial suggestion of Findlay's, I am at your service. I am afraid— I may find myself a little old for that sort of thing. I haven't tried one for ages. But we are meeting to commemorate youth, said Findlay. 
and bury our early manhood said temple well well yes let's go to the music hall by all means if you desire it it is trivial and appropriate we want no tragic issues when the men returned to findlay's study the little clock in the dimness on the mantel-shelf was pointing to half-past one after the departure the little brown room with its books and bones was undisturbed save for the two visits findlay's attentive servant paid to see to the fire and to pull down the blinds and draw the curtains the ticking of the clock was the only sound in the quiet now and then the fire flickered and stirred sending blood-red reflections chasing the shadows across the ceiling and bringing into ghostly transitory prominence some grotesque grouping of animals bones or skulls upon the shelves at last the stillness was broken by the unlatching and slamming of the heavy street door and the sound of unsteady footsteps approaching along the passage then the door opened and the two men came into the warm firelight temple came in first his brown face flushed with drink his coat unbuttoned his hands deep in his trousers pockets his christmas resolution had long since dissolved in alcohol he was a little puzzled to find himself in findlay's company and his fuddled brain insisted upon inopportune reminiscence he walked straight to the fire and stood before it an exaggerated black figure staring down into the red glow after all he said we are fools to quarrel fools to quarrel about a little thing like that damned fools findlay went to the writing-table and felt about for the matches with quivering hands it wasn't my doing he said it wasn't your doing said temple nothing ever was your doing you are always in the right findlay the all right findlay's attention was concentrated upon the lamp his hand was unsteady and he had some difficulty turning up the wicks one got jammed down and the other flared furiously when at last it was lit and turned up he came up to temple take your coat off old man and have some more whiskey he said that was a ripping little girl in skirt dance fools to quarrel trumple said slowly and then woke up to findlay's words hey take off your coat and sit down said findlay moving up the little metal table and producing cigars and a siphon and whiskey the lamp gives infernally bad light but it is all i have something wrong with the oil did you notice the drudge of that stone smashing trick temple remained erect and gloomy staring into the fire fools to quarrel he said findlay was now half drunk and his finesse began to leave him temple had been drinking heavily and was now in a curious rambling stage and findlay's one idea now was to close this curious reunion there's no woman worth a man's friendship said temple abruptly he sat down in an easy chair poured out and drank a dose of whisky and lithia the idea of friendship took possession of him and he became reminiscent of student days and student adventures for some time it was do you remember this and do you remember that and findlay grew cheerful again they were glorious times said findlay pouring whisky into temple's glass then temple started him by abruptly reverting to that bitter quarrel no woman in the world he said curse them he began to laugh stupidly after all he said in the end oh damn said findlay all oh, very well for you to swear said temple but you forget about me taint your place to swear if only you'd left things alone i thought the password was forget said findlay temple stared into the fire for a space forget he said then with a curious return to a clarity of speech findlay i'm getting drunk nonsense man take some more temple rose out of his chair with the look of one awakening there's no reason why i should get drunk because drink said findlay and forget it Fa! i want to stick my head in water i want to think what the deuce am i doing here with you of all people nonsense talk and forget it if you won't drink do you remember old jason and the boxing gloves i wonder whether you could put up your fives now temple stood with his back to the fire his brain spinning with drink and the old hatred of findlay came back in a flood he sought in his mind for some offensive thing to say and his face grew dark findlay saw that a crisis was upon him and he cursed under his breath his air of conviviality his pose of hardy comforter grew more and more difficult but what else was there to do old jason full of science and as slow as an elephant but he made boxers of us do you remember our little set to at that place in gower street to show his innocent liveliness his freedom from preoccupation findlay pushed his chair aside and stepped out into the middle of the room there he began to pose in imitation of jason and to give a colourable travesty of the old prize-fighter's instructions he picked up his boxing gloves from the shelf in the recess 
and slipped them on. Temple, lowering there on the brink of an explosion, was almost too much for his nerves. He felt his display of high spirits was a mistake, but he must go through with it now. Don't stand glooming there, man. You're in just that state when the world looks black as ink. Drink yourself merry again. There's no woman in the world worth a man's friendship that's agreed upon. Come and have a bout with these gloves of mine, four-ounce gloves. There's nothing sets the blood and spirits stirring like that. All right, said Temple, quite mechanically. And then, waking up to what he was doing, where are the other gloves? Over there in the corner, on top of the mineral cabinet. By Jove, Temple, this is like old times. Temple, quivering strangely, went to the corner. He meant to thrash Findlay, and knew that in spite of his lighter weight he would do it. Yet it seemed puerile and inadequate to the pitch of absurdity for the wrong Finley had done him was great. And putting his hand on something pale in the shadow, he touched the bulla of the whale. The temptation was like a lightning flash. He slipped one glove on his left hand and thrust the fingers of his right into the cavity of the bulla. It took all his fingers and covered his knuckles and all the back of his hand. And it was so oddly like a thumbless boxing glove, just the very shape of the padded part. His spirits rose abruptly at the sudden prospect of a savage joke. How savage it could be he did not know. Meanwhile Findlay, with a nervous alacrity, moved the lamp into the corner behind the armchair, and thrust his writing-desk into the window-bay. "'Come on,' said Findlay behind him, and abruptly he turned. Findlay looked straight into his eyes, on guard his hands half-opened. He did not see the strange substitute for a glove that covered Temple's right hand. Both men were gone so far towards drunkenness that their power of observation was obscured. For a moment they stood squaring at each other, the host smiling and his guest smiling also, but with his teeth set, two dark figures swaying in the firelight and the dim lamplight. Then Findlay struck at his opponent's face with his left hand. As he did so, Temple ducked slightly to the left and struck savagely over Findlay's shoulder at his temple with the bone-covered fist. The blow was given with such tremendous force that it sent Findlay reeling sideways, half stunned and overcome with astonishment. The thing struck his ear and the side of his face went white at the blow. He struggled to keep his footing, and as he did so Temple's gloved right hand took him in the chest and sent him spinning to the foot of the cigar cabinet. Findlay's eyes were wide open with astonishment. Temple was a lighter man by a stone or more than himself, and he did not understand how he had been felled. He was not stunned, although he was dulled by the blow as not to notice the blood running down his cheek from his ear. He laughed insincerely and, almost pulling the cigar cabinet over, scrambled to his feet, made as if he would speak, and put up his hand instinctively as Temple struck out at him again, a feint with the left hand. Findlay was an expert boxer, and, anticipating another right-hand blow over the ear, struck sharply at once with his own left hand in Temple's face, throwing his full weight into the blow and dodging Temple's reply. Temple's upper lip was cut against his teeth, and the taste of blood and the sight of it trickling down Findlay's cheek destroyed the last vestiges of restraint that drink had left him, stripped off all that education had ever done for him. There remained now only the savage man-animal, the creature that thirsts for blood. With a half-bestial cry he flung himself upon Findlay as he jumped back, and with a sudden sweep of his right arm, cut down the defence, breaking Findlay's arm just above the wrist, and following with three rapid blows of the bulla upon the face. Findlay gave an inarticulate cry of astonishment, countered weakly once, and then went down like a felled ox. As he fell, Temple fell kneeling on top of him. There was a smash as the lamp went reeling. The lamp was extinguished as it fell and left the room red and black. Findlay struck heavily at Temple's ribs, and Temple, with his left elbow at Findlay's neck, swung up his right arm and struck down a sledgehammer blow upon the face, and again and yet again, until the body beneath his knees had ceased to writhe. Then suddenly his frenzy left him at the voice of a woman shrieking so that it filled the room. He looked up and crouched motionless as he heard and saw the study door closing, and heard the patter of feet retreating in panic. Then he looked down and saw the thing that had once been the face of Findlay. For an awful minute he remained kneeling agape. Then he staggered to his feet, and stood over Findlay's body in the glow of the dying fire, like a man awakening from a nightmare. Suddenly he perceived the boule on his hand covered with blood and hair, and began to understand what had happened. In a sudden horror he flung the diabolical thing from him. It struck the floor near the cigar cabinet, rolled for a yard or so on its edge, and came to rest in almost the position it had occupied when he had first set eyes on it. 
To Temple's excited imagination, it seemed to be lying at exactly the same spot, the sole and sufficient cause of Findlay's death and his own. End of The Reconciliation The Rajah's Treasure by H. G. Wells This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Krista Zaleski. The Rajah's Treasure Between Jehun and Bimabur on the Himalayan slopes, and between the jungles and the higher country where the pines and deodars are gathered together, ruled the petty Rajah, of whose wonderful treasure I am telling. Very great was the treasure, people said, for the Rajah had prospered all his days. He had found Mindapur a village, and behold, it was a city. Below his fort of unhewn stone the flat-roofed huds of mutt had multiplied, and now there sprang up houses with upstairs rooms, and the place which had once boasted no more than one Binaya man engendered a bazaar in the midst of it, as a fat oyster secretes a pearl. And the holy place up the river prospered, and the road up the passes was made safe. Merchants and fakers multiplied about the wells. Men came and went. Twice even white men from the plain on missions to the people over beyond the deodars. And the streets of the town were ever denser with poultry and children, and little dogs dyed yellow, and with all the multitudinous rich odors of human increase. As at last, at the crown of his prosperity, this legend of his treasures began. He was a portly, yellow-faced man with a long black beard, now steadily growing gray thick lips, and shifty eyes. He was pious, very pious in his daily routine, and swift and unaccountable in his actions. None dared withstand him to his face, even in little things. Gollum Shah, his vizier, was but a servant, a carrier of orders, and Samud Singh, his master of horse, but a driller of soldiers. They were tools. He would tell them outright in his pride of power, staves in his hand that he could break at his will. He was childless, and his cousin the youth Azim Khan feared him, and only in the remotest recesses of his heart dared to wish the Rajah would presently die and make away for the scions. It would be hard to say when the first rumour spread that the Rajah of Little Mindapur was making a hoard. No one knew how it began or where, perhaps from merchants of whom he had bought. It began long before the days of the safe. It was said that rubies had been bought and hidden away, and then not only rubies but ornaments of gold and then pearls and diamonds from golconda and all manner of precious stones even the deputy commissioner at alipore had heard of it at last the story re-entered the palace at mindapore itself and azim khan who was the rajah's cousin and his heir and nominally his commander-in-chief and gollum shah the chief minister talked it over one with another in a tentative way he has something new said Gollum Shah querulously. He has something new, and he is keeping it from me. Azira Khan watched him cunningly. I have told you what I have heard, he said. For my own part, I know nothing. He goes to and fro, musing and humming to himself, said Gollum meditatively, as one who thinks of a pleasure. More rubies, they are saying, said Azim dreamily, and repeated, as if for his own pleasure, rubies. For Azim was the heir. "'Especially is it since that Englishman came,' said Gollum, three months ago. "'A big old man, not wrinkled as an old man should be, but red, "'and with red hair streaking his grey, "'and with tight skin and a big body sticking out before. "'So, an elephant of a man, a great quivering mud-bank of a man, "'who laughed mightily, so that the people stopped and listened in the street. "'He came, he laughed, and as he went away we heard them laugh together. "'Well,' said Azim, he was a diamond merchant, perhaps, or a dealer in rubies. Do Englishmen deal in such things? Would I had seen him, said Azim. He took gold away, said Gollum. Both were silent for a space, and the purring noise of the wheel of the upper well, and the chatter of voices about it rising and falling, made a pleasant sound in the air. Since the Englishman went, said Gollum, he has been different. He hides something from me, something in his robe. Rubies, what else can it be? He has not buried it, said Azim. He will. Then he will want to dig it up again and look at it, said Gollum, for he was a man of experience. I go softly. Sometimes I almost come upon him. Then he starts. He grows old and nervous, said Azim, and there was a pause. Before the English came, said Gollum, looking at the rings upon his fingers, as he recurred to his constant preoccupation, 
there were no rajahs nervous and old. That, I say, was even before the coming of the safe. It came in a packing case. Such a case it was as had never been seen before on all the slopes of the Himalayan mountains. It was an elephant's burden even on the plain. It was days drawing nearer and nearer. At Alipore, crowds went to see it pass upon the railway. Afterwards, elephants and then a great multitude of men dragged it up the hills. And this great case, being opened in the hall of audience, revealed within itself a monstrous iron box, like no other box that had ever come to the city. It had been made, so the story went, by necromancers in England, expressly to the order of the Rajah, that he might keep his treasure therein and sleep in peace. It was so hard that the hardest files powdered upon its corners, and so strong that cannon fired point-blank at it would have produced no effect upon it, and it locked with a magic lock. There was a word, and none knew the word but the Rajah. With that word, and a little key that hung about his neck, one could open the lock, but without it none could do so. The Rajah caused this safe to be built into the wall of his palace, in a little room beyond the hall of audience. He superintended the building up of it with jealous eyes, and thereafter he would go thither day by day, once at least every day, coming back with brighter eyes. He goes to count his treasure, said Gollum Shah, standing beside the empty dais, and in those days it was that the Rajah began to change. He who had been cunning and subtle became choleric and outspoken. His judgment grew harsh, and a taint that seemed to all about him to be assuredly the taint of avarice crept into his acts. Moreover, which inclined Gollum Shah to hopefulness, he seemed to take a dislike to Azim Khan. Once, indeed, he made a kind of speech in the hall of audience. Therein he declared many times over, in a peculiarly husky voice, husky yet full of conviction, that Azim Khan was not worth a half anna, not worth a half anna to any human soul. In these latter days of the Raja's decline, moreover, when merchants came, he would go aside with them secretly into the little room and speak low, so that those in the hall of audience, howsoever they strained their ears, could hear nothing of his speech. These things Gollum Shah and Azim Khan and Samad Singh, who had joined their councils, treasured in their hearts. It is true about the treasure, said Azim. They talked of it round the well of the travellers. Even the merchants from Tibet had heard the tale, and had come this way with jewels of price, and afterwards they went secretly, telling no one. And ever and again, it was said, came a negro mute from the plains, with secret parcels for the Rajah. Another stone, was the rumour that went round the city. The bee makes hordes, said Azim Khan, the Rajah's heir, sitting in the upper chamber of Gollum Shah. Therefore we will wait a while, for Azim was more coward than traitor. At last there were men in the Deccan, even who could tell you particulars of the rubies and precious stones that the Rajah had gathered together. But so circumspect was the Rajah that Azim Khan and Gollum Shah had never even set eyes on the glittering heaps that they knew were accumulating in the safe. The Rajah always went into the little room alone and even then he locked the door of the little room, and had a couple of locks, before he went to the safe and used the magic word. How all the ministers and officers and guards listened and looked at one another as the door of the room behind the curtain closed. The Rajah changed indeed in these days, not only in the particulars of his rule, but in his appearance. He is growing old. How fast he grows old! The time is almost ripe, whispered Samud Singh. The Rajah's hand became tremulous. His step was now sometimes unsteady, and his memory curiously defective. He would come back out from the treasure room, and his hand would tighten fiercely on the curtain, and he would stumble on the steps of the dais. His eyesight fails, said Gollum. See, his turban is askew. He is sleepy even in the forenoon, before the heat of the day. His judgments are those of a child. It was a painful sight to see a man so suddenly old and enfeebled still ruling men. He may go on yet a score of years, said Gollum Shah. Should a ruler hoard riches, said Sher Ali, in the guardroom, and leave his soldiers unpaid? That was the beginning of the end. It was the thought of the treasure won over the soldiers, even as it did the mullahs and the eunuchs. Why had the Rajah not buried it in some unthinkable place as his father had done before him, and killed the diggers with his hand? He has hoarded, said Samud with a chuckle, for the old Rajah had once pulled his beard only to pay for his own undoing. And in order to ensure confidence, Gollum Shah went beyond the truth, perhaps, and gave a sketchy account of the treasures to this man and that, even as a casual eyewitness might do. Then, suddenly and swiftly, the palace revolution was accomplished. 
when the lonely old rajah was killed a shot was to be fired from the harem lattice bugles were to be blown and the sepoys were to turn out in the square before the palace and fire a volley in the air the murder was done in the dark save for a little red lamp that burned in the corner azim knelt on the body and held up the wet beard and cut the throat wide and deep to make sure it was so easy why had he waited so long and then with his hands covered with warm blood he sprang up eagerly rajah at last and followed gollum and samud and the eunuchs down the long faintly moonlit passage towards the hall of audience as they did so the crack of a rifle sounded far away and after a pause came the first awaking noises of the town one of the eunuchs had an iron bar and samud carried a pistol in his hand he fired into the locks of the treasure room and wrecked them and the eunuch smashed the door in then they all rushed in together none standing aside for azim it was dark and the second eunuch went reluctantly to get a torch in fear lest his fellow murderers should open the safe in his absence but he need have had no fear the cardinal event of that night is the triumphant vindication of the advertised merits of chobe's unrivalled safes the tumult that occurred between the mandapore sepoys and the people need not concern us the people love not the new rajah let that suffice the conspirators got the key from round the dead rajah's neck and tried a multitude of the magic words of the english that samit singh knew even such words as kemup and gorblimi in vain in the morning the safe in the treasure room remained intact and defiant the woodwork about it smashed to splinters and great chunks of stone knocked out of the wall dents abundantly scattered over its impregnable door and a dust of files below and the shifty golem had to explain the matter to the soldiers and mullahs as best he could this was an extremely difficult thing to do because in no kind of business is prompt cash so necessary as in the revolutionary line the state of affairs for the next few days in mindapore was exceedingly strained one fact stands out prominently that azim khan was hopelessly feeble the soldiers would not at first believe in the exemplary integrity of the safe and a deputation insisted in the most occidental manner in verifying the new rajah's statements moreover the populace clamoured and then by a naked man running came the alarming intelligence that the new deputy commissioner at alipur was coming headlong and with soldiers to verify the account of the revolution Gollum shah and samad singh had sent him in the name of azim the new deputy commissioner was a raw young man partly obscured by a pith helmet and chock full of zeal and the desire for distinction and he had heard of the treasure he was going he said to sift the matter thoroughly on the arrival of this distressing intelligence there was a hasty and informal council of state at which azim was not present a counter-revolution was arranged and all that azim ever learnt of it was the sound of a footfall behind him and the cold touch of a pistol barrel on the neck when the commissioner arrived that dexterous statesman gollum shah and that honest soldier samad singh were ready to receive him and they had two corpses several witnesses and a neat little story in addition to azim they had shot an unpopular officer of the mindapore sepoys they told the commissioner how azim had plotted against the rajah and raised a military revolt and how the people who loved the old rajah even as gollum shah and samad singh loved him had quelled the revolt and how peace was restored again and gollum explained how azim had fought for life even in the hall of audience and how he gollum had been wounded in the struggle and how samud had shot azim with his own hand and the deputy commissioner being weak in his dialect had swallowed it all all round the deputy commissioner in the minds of the people of the palace and the city hung the true story of the case as it seemed to gollum shah like an avalanche ready to fall and yet the deputy commissioner did not learn of it for four days and gollum and samud went to and fro whispering and pacifying promising to get at the treasure as soon as the deputy commissioner could be got out of the way and as they went to and fro so also the report went to and fro that gollum and samud had opened the safe and hidden the treasure and closed and locked it again and bright eyes watched them curiously and hungrily even as they had watched the rajah in the days that were gone the city is no longer an abiding place for you and me said gollum shah in a moment of clear insight they are mad about this treasure golconda would not satisfy them the deputy commissioner when he heard their story did indeed make knowing inquiries as knowing as the knowingness of the english goes in order to show himself not too credulous but he elicited nothing he had heard tales of treasure had the commissioner and of a great box so had gollum and samud but where it was they could not tell 
they too had certainly heard tales of treasure many tales indeed perhaps there was treasure had the deputy commissioner had the scientific turn of mind he would have observed that a strong smell of gunpowder still hung about the audience chamber more than was explained by the narrative told him and had he explored the adjacent apartments he would presently have discovered the small treasure room with its smashed locks and the ceiling now dependent ruins and amid the ruins the safe bulging perilously from the partly collapsed walls but still unconquered and with its treasures unexplored also it is a fact that golem shaw's bandaged hand was not the consequence of heroism in combat but of certain private blasting operations too amateurishly prosecuted so you have the situation deputy commissioner installed in the palace sending incorrect information to headquarters and awaiting instructions the safe as safe as ever assistant conspirators grumbling louder and louder and golem and samad getting more and more desperate lest this voice should reach the deputy's ears then came the night when the commissioner heard a filing and a tapping and being a brave man rose and went forthwith alone and very quietly across the hall of audience pistol in hand in search of the sound across the hall a light came from an open door that had been hidden in the day by a curtain stopping silently in the darkness of the outer apartment he looked into the treasure room and there stood golem with his arm in a sling holding a lantern while samud fumbled with pieces of wire and some little keys they were without boots but otherwise they were dressed ready for a journey the deputy commissioner was for a government official an exceedingly quick-witted man he slipped back in the darkness again and within five minutes golem and samud still fumbling heard footsteps hurrying across the hall of audience and saw a flicker of light out went their lantern with a groan because of a bandaged arm but it was too late in another moment lieutenant earl in pajamas and boots with a brace of revolvers and a couple of rifles behind him stood in the doorway of the treasure room and gollum and samud were caught samud clicked his pistol and then threw it down for it was three to one gollum being not only a bandaged man but fundamentally a man of peace when the intelligence of this treachery filtered from the palace into the town there was an outbreak of popular feeling and a dozen officious persons set out to tell the deputy commissioner the true connection between gollum samud and the death of the rajah the first to penetrate to the deputy commissioner's presence was an angry faker from the colony that dwelt about the holy place and after a patient hearing the deputy commissioner extracted the thread of the narrative from the fabric of curses in which the holy man presented it this is most singular said the deputy commissioner to the lieutenant standing in the treasure room which looked as though the palace had been bombarded and regarding the battered but still inviolable safe here we seem to have the key of the whole position key said the lieutenant it's the key they haven't got curious mingling of the new and old said the deputy commissioner patent safe and a hoard send to alipore and wire chobs i suppose said the lieutenant the deputy commissioner signified that was his intention and they sent guards before and behind and all about the treasure room until the proper instructions about the lock should come so it was that the pax britannica solemnly took possession of the rajah's hoard and men in simla heard the news and envied the deputy commissioner his adventure with all their hearts for his promptitude and decision was a matter of praise and they said that mindapur would certainly be annexed and added to the district over which he ruled only a fat old man named mcturk living alone in alipur a big man with a noisy quivering laugh and a secret trade with certain native potentates did not hear the news excepting only the news of the murder of the rajah and the departure of the deputy commissioner for several days he heard nothing of the disposition of the treasure an unfortunate thing since among other things he had sold the rajah his safe and may even have known the word by which the lock was opened the deputy commissioner had theatrical tastes these he gratified under the excuse that display was above all things necessary in dealing with orientals he imprisoned his four malefactors theatrically and when the instructions came from chobs he had the safe lugged into the hall of audience in order to open it with more effect the commissioner sat on the dais while the engineer worked at the safe on the crimson steps in the central space was stretched a large white cloth it reminded the deputy commissioner of a picture he had seen of alexander of damascus receiving the treasures of darius it is gold said one bystander to another there was a sound of chinking as they brought the safe in my brother was among those who hauled the engineer clicked the lock 
every eye in the hall of audience grew brighter and keener excepting the eyes of the deputy commissioner he felt the dignity of his responsibilities and sat upon the dais looking as much like the pax britannica as possible holy smoke said the engineer and slammed the safe again a murmur of exclamations ran round the hall everyone was asking everyone else what they had seen an asp said someone the deputy commissioner lost his imperturbability what is it he said springing to his feet the engineer leant across the safe and whispered two words something indistinct and with a blasphemous adjective in front what said the deputy commissioner sharply glass said the engineer in a bitter whisper broken bottles hundreds let me see said the deputy commissioner losing all his dignity scotch if i'm not mistaken said the engineer sniffing curiously curse it said the deputy commissioner and looked up to meet a multitude of ironical eyes er the assembly is dismissed said the deputy commissioner what a fool he must have looked wheezed mcturk who did not like the deputy commissioner what a fool he must have looked simple enough said mcturk when you know how it came about but how did it come about asked the station master secret drinking said mcturk bourbon whisky i taught him how to take it myself but he didn't dare let on that he was doing it poor old chap mindapore is one of the most fanatically mahometan states in the hills you see and he always was a secretive kind of chap and given to doing things by himself so he got that safe to hide it in and keep the bottles broke em up to pack i suppose when it got too full lord i might a known when people spoke of his treasure i never thought of putting that and the safe and the bourbon together but how plain it is and what a self for parkinson pounded glass the accumulation of years lord i'd a given a couple of stone off my weight to see him open that safe end of the rajah's treasure a perfect gentleman on wheels by h g wells this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by krista zaleski a perfect gentleman on wheels a bicycling adventure and what came of it it was the stirring of spring the tendency of fashion and the ghost of a sneer drove him to it more particularly the ghost of a sneer it was the tragedy of his life that he admired her and he struggled against her in vain she was frankly antipathetic you might have called her anything before you would have called her chic at times he had to admit that she was to tell the dreadful truth robust moreover the most exquisite epigrams the prettiest turns of wit would often as not simply make her stare and laugh only too evidently at him and yet when healthy philistine schoolgirl asked him do you ever venture beyond the park mr crampton it sufficed he told his mother plainly his honour was involved and an irreverent porter saw him already heated wheeling his machine upstairs from the sutton platform and there are few things less adapted to go upstairs with any pretence to grace on his way to brighton and her his machine like himself was a little overdressed we are far from a sound criticism of bicycles chocolate enamelled it was with translucent mudguards and the daintiest white handles and the gear case was of filmy celluloid with a sort of metal dab like a metal upon it he wore a cocked hat or at least one of those brown felt hats that ought to be called cocked hats whatever the proper name for them may be and to distinguish himself from the common cycling cad among other reasons he wore trousers the brown of his clothing was apt to his machine and his tie white and pretty and when the vulgar cabman outside sutton station called new woman after him he pretended not to hear and went on mounting his machine all across the road he was quite a sight to see riding up the road toward belmont and the sun was so struck by his spick and span appearance that he picked out every line of enamel and metal on him and dazzled the passer-by therewith something like a thing to shine on said the sun just look at this and did you ever in the excess of his admiration he had begun his ride from london to brighton at sutton which was generous treatment for london in the geographical sense his mother he was her only son had gone to brighton by train the fentons were there also and the juxtaposition had its quality of design his mother had devoted her life to him she held that he was delicate and knowing the dreadfulness of public schools almost as well as oscar browning 
had kept him by her under a progressive series of amenable tutors, making a perfect gentleman of him according to her lights. And Madge Fenton, with her half-share in Fenton's safe cure, was just the fit mate for the sole proprietor of Crampton's meat-juice. It was quite a mother's plan to marry her son and yet keep him in the family, and certainly he appreciated Madge, though her attitude was a little doubtful. Yet the steady pressure of her elders was bound to win in the long run, and she was a good girl, as times go. The road from Sutton to Burg Heath looks like any other road on a map, but unlike the generality of roads known to Mr. Crampton, it persistently went uphill. It was already going uphill at Sutton Station and it went on pretty steeply for a space, but with an air of its being the last effort. Then round a bend came a view of a huge industrial home, and another last effort. Then a clear interval, even downhill, to Belmont Station. And then it started off again fresh as a daisy. It went uphill visibly for a mile to Banstead Station, and then massed by trees it continued to go uphill. Mr. Crampton was surprised but the day was young, and his man had oiled and adjusted his machine to a nicety. So he stuck to it, riding steady and swinging a cigarette in the disengaged hand, until recently a bounder, with a machine that went clank, became audible behind him. To Mr. Crampton the idea of being overhauled by a member of the lower classes was distasteful, and relying on the clank and the excellence of his machine, he threw away the cigarette and quickened his pace. Thereupon the bounder rang his bell, it was a beast of a cheap bell, and the clanking grew more frequent and louder, until it was close behind Mr. Crampton. After a sharp spurt, Mr. Crampton decided that he would not race after all, and the bounder drew alongside. He was quite the most dreadful type of bounder, with a machine with a loose mudguard and a speckled bell. He had a very dirty suit of CTC grey, and a perspiring red face with a strip of damp hair across his forehead, and he had the cheek to speak to Mr. Crampton. "'Pretty jigger,' said the bounder. Mr. Crampton was so startled he wobbled and almost collided. "'I beg your pardon,' he said in a repressive tone. "'Nice-looking machine you've got.' Mr. Crampton was at quite a loss for words. But he was determined to shut the fellow up promptly. "'I'm afraid I can't say the same of yours,' he said at length. "'No, it isn't up to much,' said the bounder cheerfully. "'Are you going far? Because if so—' Two girls, possibly nice girls, appeared riding down toward them. They might think that he and Bounder were travelling together. It's no business of yours, said Mr. Crampton, where I'm going, and something indistinct about damned impertinence. Lord, said the Bounder, no offence. It took him a minute to digest. Then he said something over his shoulder to Mr. Crampton that was lost, and putting his head down below his shoulders went clanking off at a great pace, his shoulders moving with his feet in a manner entirely despicable. Mr. Crampton rode quite erect and with only one hand on the handle, to show that he was not racing, until the girls were well past him, and then he dismounted. This internal hill was tiresome, and he did not want to overtake the bounder. Walking, one could notice the fine growth of green with which the hedges were speckled, and the gum exuding chestnut buds, and the dead nettles were all in flower. In fact, it was a pleasant change from the saddle for a man who was not a scorcher. And at last he came to Burgheath, as this seemed to be a sort of village green, he mounted again. Some way along was a little sweet-stuff shop, and outside was the bounder's machine. The bounder was in the doorway, with his hands in his pockets eating. He looked round at Mr. Crampton, and immediately looked away again, with a hollow pretense of self-esteem, and away down a hill Mr. Crampton was passed by a tandem bicycle. He overtook its riders, a girl and a man, walking the next ascent. They seemed to be father and daughter, the father a sturdy, red-bearded man with very fat legs, and the daughter decidedly pretty. She was dressed in greenish-gray and had red hair. Mr. Crampton was very glad indeed that he had got rid of the bounder forthwith. He had to set his teeth to get up the hill, but of course it was impossible to dismount. And then came a run down, and then a long, gentle slope that was rather trying, with a pretty girl on a tandem behind, that is, to keep one in the saddle. Rygate Hill came none too soon to give Mr. Crampton a decent excuse for dismounting, so he put the machine carefully where it looked well on the turf, and took out his silver cigarette case, and was in his attitude ready, looking over the clustering town and broad blue wheeled, as the tandem couple came walking down the hill. So far the ride had been very pleasant. After that the bounder, hot and panting, he came toward the turf as if contemplating a lounge, 
and his eye caught the chocolate bicycle. He glanced swiftly up at Mr. Crampton, and went incontinently down the hill toward town, visibly discomfited. Mr. Crampton lunched in Reigate. It was in the afternoon that his adventures really began, as he rode toward Crawley. The morning's ride had told on him, and three gates had the honour of supporting him for leisurely intervals between Reigate and Horley. Cyclists became frequent, and as they went by during his sessions on the gate he smoked ostentatiously, or, after he had smoked sufficiently, sketched in a little Morocco-bound sketch-book, just to show that he was not simply resting. And among others a very pretty girl flashed by, and accompanied. Now Mr. Crampton, in spite of his regard for Madge, was not averse to dreams of casual romance. And the bicycle in its earlier phases has a peculiar influence upon the imagination. To ride out from the familiar locality, into strange roads stretching away into the unknown, to be free to stop or go on, irrespective of hour or companion, inevitably brings the adventurer's side uppermost. And Mr. Crampton, descending from his gate and mounting, not two minutes after she had passed, presently overtook her near the crossroad to Horley, wheeling her machine. She had a charmingly cut costume, and her hair was a pleasant brown, and her ear, as one came riding up behind her, was noticeably pretty. She had punctured the tire of her hind wheel. It ran flat and flaccid. The case was legible a hundred yards off. Now this is the secret desire of all lone men who go down into the country on wheels. The proffered help, the charming talk, the idyllic incident. Who knows what delightful developments? So that a great joy came to Mr. Crampton. He dismounted a little way behind her, advanced gracefully, proffered the repair outfit in his wallet. He had never attempted to repair a tire before, and so he felt confident of his ability. The young lady was inclined to be distant at first, which was perfectly correct of her. But seeing that it was four miles to Crawley, and Mr. Crampton a mere boy, and evidently of a superior class, she presently accepted his services. So, coming to a convenient grassy place at a crossroad, Mr. Crampton turned the machine over on its saddle and handles, severely bruising his knee as he did so, and went quietly and methodically to work, it being then about three o'clock in the afternoon, and the sun very bright and warm. He talked to her easily. Where had she punctured? She did not quite know. She had only just noticed that the tire was all flabby. A very unpleasant discovery, said Mr. Crampton. We must see just what precisely is the matter. It's very kind of you, she said. Are you sure you can spare the time? I'm merely running down to Brighton, he said. I couldn't think of leaving you in this predicament. Mr. Crampton had, of course, no mechanic's knowledge of bicycles. But he knew the things were very simple. He knew he had to remove the tire— and it did not take him long to discover that in order to remove the tire, he would have to remove the wheel. How to get the wheel off was a little puzzling at first. It was evident the chain would have to come away. That involved operations with a dress guard and a gear case. It's an inductive process, said Mr. Crampton lightly, concealing a faint qualm of doubt and setting to work on the gear case. They're frightfully complicated things, she said. These machinery people make them rather stupidly, said Mr. Crampton. I shouldn't dare take the thing to pieces as you are doing. It's very simple, really. I think men are always so much cleverer than girls at this sort of thing. Mr. Crampton did not answer for a second. You've blackened your fingers, she said. It was very nice and friendly of her, but a little distracting. She kept stepping about on the growing circle of nuts, chains, screw-hammer, rochers, and so forth about Mr. Crampton, and made many bright, intelligent little remarks that required answering. And she really was pretty. Mr. Crampton still continued to enjoy the incident, in spite of his blackened hands and the heat of the day, and the quite remarkable softness of the nuts on her machine. "'If we are better at machine-mending and that sort of thing,' he said, "'you have your consolations.' "'I don't think so.' "'The emotions,' said Mr. Crampton. "'But men have emotions.' "'As girls have bicycles,' said Mr. Crampton, with the air of a neat thing, mislaying the pin of the chain and proceeding to pull out the wheel. The removal of the tire was the turning point of the affair." It simply would not come off the rim. These detachable, said Mr. Crampton. He had to ask her to pull, and the struggle was violent for a moment, and a spoke got bent. Then he pinched her finger severely. He knew the operation depended upon a knack, and as he was ashamed of not knowing the knack, he pretended to be doing something else when a man's cyclist went by. Three little children came by and seemed profoundly interested, until Mr. Crampton stopped and stared steadily at them. 
then each began edging behind the other and so they receded and a tramp offered ingenious but impractical suggestions until mr crampton gave him sixpence to take them away then came the tandem he had seen in the morning going londonward and the old gentleman insisted on knowing what was the matter beastly officious of him we can't remove the tire said the young lady a little needlessly crampton thought simple enough said the old gentleman in abominable taste it was simple in his hands in a minute the tire lay detached i can manage now thanks said mr crampton rather stiffly quite sure said the old gentleman quite said mr crampton with a quiet stare and the old gentleman mounted his machine for of course mr crampton trusted to the directions on his repair outfit as any one would thank you very much indeed said the young lady no trouble at all said the old gentleman and off he rode the next misunderstanding was entirely due to the silly vague way in which the directions on the box were written really you had to stick the round patch thing into the puncture but mr crampton read rather carelessly and first of all cut out a circular place in the air chamber and seeing it was not quite round he cut a little larger and so on until it was a little too big for the patch thing the young lady had been silent for the last ten minutes or so watching mr crampton's face but now she asked suddenly are you sure that is the right thing to do it says so on the box said mr crampton looking up with a smile but i really don't see how we are to manage it quite do you know said the young lady i wanted to be in crawley by four it was a little rude of her but mr crampton looked at his watch it was five minutes past four dear me he said agreeably the time has flown and suddenly he remembered he was twenty-six miles from brighton i think do you know said the young lady if you don't mind i will wheel my machine after all it seems such a long job mending it and really in crawley the man these local fellows aren't always quite reliable i'm frightfully sorry you know not to have got it right just at once but it was very kind of you to try she said do you know said mr crampton even now for the thing really interested him his idea was to try a piece of paper smeared with solution but it did not work and at quarter past four he began putting the machine together with nothing but a neat circular opening cut in the air tube of the tire to show for his wasted hour his interest was fading and the girl's manner was not so nice as it had been and curiously enough the wheel would not go on right and there was difficulty about the chain one or two of the little nut things must have got themselves lost in the grass and trivial though they were this complicated the business mr crampton was becoming painfully aware that his hands were black and his cuffs crumpled he suddenly felt tired and disgusted at the whole absurd incident and seeing the growing impatience of the girl he hurried the rebuilding indiscreetly using his wrench as a hammer when necessary the eyes of passers-by seemed ironical bicycles are odd things he made it look all right except the gear case which he had trodden on but when he stood it up right way up the chain flapped about on the gear case and the wheel would not go round he tried what a little force would do but only produced curious clanking noises it was a most disappointing incident and although the girl was indisputably pretty curiously devoid of any real romantic quality it doesn't seem right quite yet she said i'm afraid not said mr crampton rather red in the face holding the machine by saddle and handle and looking at it in a speculative way it was really rather a difficult situation and he was trying to think what to do next it came of being a gentleman of course and chivalrous bounders would have ridden by in the first place without attempting to help he wanted very badly to swear and it was very clear indeed in his mind that he ought to be riding on his self-control was admirable i'm afraid it's no go he said looking up and smiling she was looking quite straightly at him there was no appearance of anger in her manner but she remarked quietly i don't think you ought to have touched my machine i'm afraid you know very little about them mr crampton perceived at once that she was not a lady all the more reason he told himself that he should assert himself a gentleman it seems to me he said that i can do very little good in this case it seems so to me she said annoyed to find him not humiliated there came a rhythmic clanking on the road and the red damp-haired bounder in grey whom mr crampton had snubbed at banstead going londonward now and riding laboriously drew near hello he said softly to himself as he passed nothing wrong positively she answered him mr crampton did not notice it because he was looking at the machine but she must have done so the bounder was already some yards down the road but he dismounted with such alacrity that he almost tumbled over he flung his machine into the hedge in a fine careless way and came back what is it he said nothing said mr crampton full of angry shame 
had a tumble miss asked the bounder not at all abashed with his eye on the bent mudguard i can manage very well thank you said mr crampton let's have a look at the jigger said the bounder advancing and suddenly became aware that he had met this obstructive person in brown before he looked at the girl please let the gentleman see said the young lady quietly at that mr crampton's temper gave way entirely very well he said quite crossly i understood i was to mend your machine i've wasted an hour on it steady on said the bounder very quietly bending down and looking at the machine i didn't know you wanted to stop every man that came along said mr crampton suddenly exasperated to insult steady on said the bounder again mr crampton replied with a look of freezing contempt when you were rude to me said the bounder looking up i let you alone but if you're going to be rude to this young lady i shall just punch your head see i'm an engine fitter and it don't take that to see you've been pretty near knocking out all the quality of a valuable machine mr crampton was breathless with anger i'm quite prepared to pay for any damage i've done he said neither of them had the manners to answer though he stood quite a minute trembling with indignation mr crampton picked up his machine mounted a little clumsily and rode off he rode very fast until he was round the bend just to show how angry he was for a space he was boiling with rage then he laughed aloud in a sardonic fashion of all possible experiences he said ha ha and this comes of trying to help a fellow creature the sardonic mood remained he hated every human being in crawley both on the right hand side and the left most of them from their manner seemed to be aware of his recent indignities he rested at crawley an hour hating people quietly but steadily and thinking of alternatives to his sayings and doings with the bounder and the young lady it was six when he rode on again and the sun was setting a mile out of crawley he came to a long dark hill twilight came as a surprise and with it came an acute sense of fatigue he dismounted presently he mounted again it was difficult to decide which progress was most tiring a foot or a wheel and this was pleasure an acute realization of the indestructible vulgarity of cycling came into his mind a dirty fatiguing pursuit that put one at the mercy of every impudent cad one met he began to stamp with his feet and use words that even his mother's care had not prevented his learning the road before him was dark interminable impossible he saw a milestone dimly and went to it with a lingering hope that providence might have interposed on his behalf and cut out a dozen miles or so but there it was brighton twenty miles and then comes a mystery within ninety minutes mr crampton was alighting outside the best society hotel at brighton there is a railway station at three bridges but i hold that an author should respect the secrets of his characters there was no incriminatory ticket on his machine and he never gave any one the slightest ground for supposing he did anything but cycle the whole way his hat was awry his clothes dirty his linen crumpled and his hands and face and tie were defiled with black from the young lady's chain his mother received him with effusion she had grown nervous with the darkness my dear dear cecile she said advancing but how white and tired you look and the dust upon you she laid caressing fat hands upon his shoulder don't said mr crampton briefly and flung himself into a chair scowling you might give a chap something to drink he said instead of standing there but after dinner he recovered and talked to her among other things he admitted he liked madge and seemed to take his mother's timid suggestions in a sympathetic spirit but i wish she didn't bicycle he said it's a bit common they lunched the next day with the fentons he waited for his opportunity to score his point making no attempt to lead up to it and so it did not come off until late in the afternoon mrs crampton would have boasted to madge of his manliness in riding the whole way but for his express prohibition no he said quite calmly in answer to some remark i didn't train i wheeled down madge looked quite surprised fifty-two miles she said i don't know the distance said mr crampton it didn't seem so exceedingly long the increase in her respect was swift and evident how long did it take you six seven hours i started about midday but i didn't scorch you know and i stopped for a half hour mending a girl's tire he tried to look as though he had done nothing extraordinary here's ethel of all people said mrs fenton rising my dear mr crampton looked up and there in the doorway was the heroine of the punctured tire madge rose too to welcome her friend and missed his expression and here is cousin cecile she said introducing mr crampton the newcomer advanced brightly stared hesitated and bowed coldly mrs crampton never quite understood the business because her son was not only reticent but extremely irritable when questioned evidently the young people had met before and were under considerable constraint she is inclined to think from the subsequent incidents 
that Ethel was a designing sort of girl, who set Madge against him with the idea of securing him herself. In that, at any rate, she was disappointed. But the Brighton gathering was certainly a failure, and Mr. Crampton is still not engaged. Yet, seeing his position, it is odd some girl has not snapped him up. Madge, silly girl, married a young doctor three months ago. End of A Perfect Gentleman on Wheels Mr. Marshall's Doppelganger by H. G. Wells This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Krista Zaleski Mr. Marshall's Doppelganger Among the curious cases which I, as a once active member of the Society for the Rehabilitation of Abnormal Phenomena, have been called upon to investigate, that of Mr. Marshall's apparition to the Rev. Philip Burwash, of Sussexville, and to the Rev. Philip Wendover, his curate, is certainly by no means the least curious. It was communicated to the Society by the Rev. George Burwash himself, with a mass of authenticating evidence quite in excess of the ordinary case of this description. The Rev. George Burwash is one of that little army of honest and worthy amateur investigators scattered throughout the country, clergymen, retired officers, professors keeping holiday, and ladies of every description, who, in spite of certain inexperience in the handling of human evidence, are doing such excellent work in reviving the earth's decadent belief in spiritual entities. He was already favorably known to the society by his experiments in thought transference. The apparition occurred on Christmas Eve, 1895, and his communication was read before the society in the subsequent January. My inquiries into Sussexville were prosecuted during the April and May following. A doppelganger, I need scarcely remind the reader, is the neo-English for a double. You are here, and yet you appear suddenly to a friend or acquaintance elsewhere. In other words, a doppelganger is a phantasm of a living person. Such phantasms are believed by many quite reputable people nowadays to be of frequent occurrence, and, as in the case I had to examine, are often curiously purposeless. Here we had Mr. Marshall appearing suddenly and with a disturbed countenance before Mr. Burwash and his curate, uttering horrible imprecations, threatening him and then suddenly disappearing. He cursed and threatened without rhyme or reason. His procedure was totally without symbolic value. But so vivid and so sonorous was the phantasm, that at the time it did not enter into the head of Mr. Burwash to regard him as anything but a real person albeit the figure moved with a curious gliding motion, markedly different from walking. Until it vanished, indeed, the thought of ghosts did not occur to him. The manner of disappearance and the subsequent silence, as the reverend gentleman described them, were, however, quite sufficiently ghost-like for any reasonable person. My first proceeding in elucidating this interesting case was, of course, to visit the scene of the appearance, and courteously but exhaustively to cross-examine Mr. Burwash and Mr. Wendover, on the particulars of the incident. Mr. Burwash occupies a house on the hillside above the church, and, in consequence of the growth of his family, he has, for the sake of quiet, built himself a small but convenient study of pine up the hill. A path crosses over the crest of the hill, and descends steeply from a little gate near the study between the vicarage hedge and the churchyard wall, to the lych gate in the main road below. On Christmas Eve, Mr. Burwash had been writing late at his Christmas sermon, having been delayed during the day by a parcel of spookical literature, and it was after midnight that he finished. His curate, with whom he is, for a vicar, on exceptionally friendly terms, came into the study and sat smoking, while the vicar alternately talked to him and punctuated his discourse for the morrow. It adds to the interest of the case that this curate, Mr. Wendover, was a declared skeptic. When the punctuation was completed, the vicar got up, stretched, and opened his study door to look out at the weather. He saw by the glare from the door that a few flakes of snow were falling, and he was preparing to turn then remark upon this to the curate when suddenly, and abruptly, Mr. Marshall appeared outside the gate, and stood for a moment swaying exactly like a drunken man, and apparently struggling with violent internal emotions. Then, finding his voice, he poured forth with dramatic unexpectedness, a volley of curses so gross and personal that I had the greatest difficulty in persuading Mr. Burwash, in the interests of science, to repeat them. 
the curate became aware of mr marshall's presence for the first time when he heard this outbreak he sprang to his feet and saw marshall distinctly over his superior's shoulder then as abruptly the man staggered and vanished into the night as he did so a gust of wind whirled the snowflakes about and the study door behind mr burwash slammed violently mr burwash was shut out and the curate in in his communication to the society mr burwash laid great stress upon this fact of the slamming door because he inclines to the belief that it shows a quasi-material nature in phantasms for as he very pertinently asks how otherwise could the disappearance of a ghost cause a gust of wind that however is a side issue as soon as they had recovered from their surprise mr burwash went to the gate expecting to find marshall lying there but up the hill and down the pathway was deserted that substantially was the story of the vision of mr burwash and by itself it would of course have had little or no interest as i immediately pointed out marshall himself may have passed that way in an intoxicated condition and his sudden and gliding disappearance may have been due to his feet slipping on the frozen snow that veneered the pathway that closing door too by cutting off the light may have aided the effect and the path is so steep that one can reasonably imagine a man who has lost his footing going down the entire slope of the hill in a second or so in the time that is that it took mr burwash to reopen his door that indeed was the view mr burwash himself at first took of the matter and it is i suppose the explanation that would recommend itself to any sane person mr wendover of course agreed with him but having a scarcely explicable doubt about the business lurking in his mind the vicar took the very first opportunity of taxing marshall who was usually a sober and steady man with the almost unpardonable insults he had uttered overnight in any case and without the faintest suspicion that anything psychic had happened the vicar would have done so though not perhaps so promptly this opportunity of reproof he made in the afternoon of christmas day he found mr and mrs marshall drinking strong tea together and it carried out the common-sense theory of the affair that marshall should have a headache still and have been quite unable to participate in any enjoyment in their simple but of course extremely bilious christmas meal and he freely and contritely admitted he had been drunk overnight but when mr burwash proceeded with some heat to charge him with the filthy blasphemies of the previous evening mrs marshall fired up indignantly and then it was that the extraordinary side of this incident came to light there was the clearest evidence evidence strong enough to hang a man indeed if need had been that marshall had never been near the vicar's study at all on christmas eve that the thing was an absolute impossibility that in fact about half past eleven half an hour before the apparition that is he had been picked up helplessly drunk by some charitable neighbours about a couple of hundred yards from the seven thorns carried the whole mile and a half to his own home carried into his own kitchen and dumped down there at the very moment when his almost equally inebriated doppelganger was insulting the vicar three-quarters of a mile away i test every link in the chain of evidence as i thought and not a link failed mrs marshall told me how she had gone to bed being tired and how when the good man failed to appear after half-past ten she had grown anxious and at last hearing voices outside had shivered out of bed and gone to the window a mr ted apps two brothers named durkin one a blacksmith and the other a watchmaker and a mr hetherington a baker were walking in a leisurely and voluminous manner along the road singing as they walked she knew mr apps and opened the window and called to him she asked him whether he had seen mr marshall at that the little party stopped and interrogated one another they all distinctly remembered marshall being at the seven thorns and until she called their attention to the matter had had a vague impression that he was still convivively with them her wifely anxiety being only too evident and they full of that feeling of mutual helpfulness that still thank heaven distinguishes our homely country christmas tide it was natural they should offer to return for him all right miss marshall they cried after one another in a reassuring voice and turned and making the night cheerful with marshall's name returned round the long winding road toward the seven thorns all were seasonably inebriated and no doubt they were now scattered distantly and now in an amiable knot together as they reeled along calling after marshall but all distinctly remember what was happening at the time i have elaborately verified the story from all four of them everything was as explicit as evidence could be twarn't not hun yards off st thorns said the blacksmith jurgen that us found em there he was with his ed against the old fence and his blessed old white legs 
it was mr marshall's weakness invariably to wear a peculiarly light variety of corduroy trousers a stick in art just helpless he was ad to carry in every blessed yard us did he was bad i tell ye the others corroborated exactly marshall's speech they agreed was incoherent shapeless in fact had he been able to surmount one impossibility and get up to the viker's study it would have been equally impossible for him to have articulated a curse of that they were all convinced and i imagine that the process of carrying him home along the dark road must have been a pretty severe test of insensibility didn't you drop him i asked of the elgar durgan oh we dropped him said durgan reassuringly we dropped him right enough and lord what a job we did have a pickin of em up to be sure and he proceeded to give me a detailed narrative as he remembered it of the entire journey consequent upon mr marshall's incapacity to walk mrs marshall had to come down and open the door in order that they might carry him in but being in a deshabille that she considered unbecoming she stipulated that they should not enter until she had had time to retire upstairs again as they came in she held a candle over the banisters and directed them where to deposit their burden mr apps being in a festive mood then demanded drinks round but the others being soberer overruled him and after they had retired she descended and locked the front door afterwards it would seem that mr apps returned hammered at the door and demanded drinks again twice or three times she said she was alarmed in this way and then mr apps apparently abandoned his quest she laid great stress on the aggressive behaviour of mr apps on account of the trouble about the missing sausages and mince pie to which i shall presently allude as marshall rarely drank and as mrs marshall was a person of refined taste with a womanly horror of an intoxicated man she did not go down to him in the kitchen until the early morning and then she found him still in a drink-sodden sleep upon the hearth-rug with a pool of melted snow about him and there what one may call the case of the alibi ends strong that case indisputably is the reader must admit now here we have an extraordinary contradiction between two perfectly credible stories on the one hand two clergymen and one a sceptic and even a scoffer at psychic experts witness that marshall was in one place and on the other four indisputably honest villagers and the man's own wife testify as emphatically that he was in quite another place i sifted and weighed every scrap of evidence and could see no way to reconcile the two except by taking the view that mr burwash took and admitting a belief in doppelgangers to that effect i finally reported to the society altogether i gave the business a clear seven days only one alternative to that acquiescence seemed possible to me and that was that the vicar and his curate in spite of almost vehement assurance of mr burwash had not seen marshall at all i spent three days seeking a colourable substitute for marshall a person who seen casually might have been mistaken for him and not one could i find he had a noticeably long nose a fresh complexion and a large mouth even in his dress he was distinctive in view of the fact that the light of the vicar's study fell fully on the face of the apparition the mistaken identity notion failed hopelessly as an explanation it was doppelganger or another doppelganger to my mind seemed the more credible climax in the whole course of my career as a psychic inquirer i had certainly never come upon any occult phenomena so absolutely a tried and proven thing i ask the reader to stop at this stage to recapitulate the case as i have stated it and to consider whether the proof does not seem to be practically complete no one at all familiar with modern psychical research will find any discredit to the story in the absolute carelessness and purposelessness of the appearance i need scarcely say what a hearty welcome the society which was naturally glad to find its existence justified according to my personal conclusions people who have committed themselves to psychical research who have been called knaves and fools for their curiosity cannot be expected to judge too sceptically such a well-authenticated case as mine the case was if i may use a vulgar but vivid expression flapped vigorously in the faces of our detractors all over the world and my own appearance at the may meeting of the society was in its way an ovation and every inducement was held out to mr marshall to doppelgang again chapter two mention has already been made of the rev philip wendover in connection with this story mr wendover belonged to that large and i fear i must write prejudiced class who will not have psychic phenomena at any price 
He was a fair, athletic young man, and he had formerly been an assistant master at Dinchester. To that I must describe his extraordinary facility with slang, which occasionally even affected his pulpit deliverances. From first to last, while I was unraveling this story, he had nothing but derision for me, in spite of his being my most important witness. Indeed, I quite sickened of his pet phrase of Tommy Rot. What Tommy Rot at all is, he would say in his riotous, amiable way a grown man, presumably sane and educated, spending days and days hunting the ghost of a dead superstition for a lot of piffling old fools in London. Why the deuce don't you dig, man? Do something useful. You're strong enough. Well, I would say, here are my facts. Oh, facts be jiggered, he would say. Facts that prove doppelganging are facts I have no respect for. But I have, I would say. What beastly rot! You've got a flaw somewhere. You know you have. If facts prove errant nonsense, it shows that there's something wrong. Then I would begin to state my case. Show me the flaw, I would say. And directly I begin to marshal my evidence, he would lose his brief temper and begin to shout me down. Did I think he had the time to go over every leaky tin pot ghost story in the country before he had a right to disbelieve? And I would raise my voice to avoid be shouted down. If Marshall has a doppelganger, let him bring him up here in the daylight, he would say and similar illogical nonsense, offering to board and clothe the two of them for a year out of his own meagre income, shouting extravagant promissory notes at the doppelganger and so forth. And then, suddenly, at the height of our shouting, he would leave off quite abruptly, stare savagely at his pipe, and ask me for a match. Have you a match? he used to say, as though that was the thing that had driven him to revolt. That, by tacit understanding, suspended the quarrel. I would hand him a match to relight his pipe, he would make some indifferent remark at a tangent, and we would go on talking and smoking together like a pair of brothers. The row, when it must have seemed to an eavesdropper on the point of blows, would vanish before one could snap one's fingers. For his choleric outbreaks, like my own, were as brief as they were violent, like tropical thunderstorms more than anything else in the world. Now, after I had returned to my chambers in Museum Street, I was surprised one afternoon in May by a visit from Wendover. I was collecting some new and interesting evidence upon crystal gazing that had recently come to hand, when I heard him noisily ascend the stairs. He came in, with all the tumultuous violence of triumphant common sense shouting and blowing, flung his umbrella on a haunted sofa I had on loan under observation, slapped down his hat on the planchette, and sat in my easy chair. Give me some tea, my good man, he bawled, and then I'll tell you an eye-opener. You're a doppelganger. He's hoist. I tried to be as cool and acrid as possible, though this interruption was certainly something of a shock, and I begged him to let me know how the hoisting was accomplished. And waving his bread and butter at me to accentuate his story, and ever and anon drinking his tea noisily and eagerly, he told me the true story of the Marshall doppelganger. You know there was a thundering row blowing up about Mrs. Marshall's sausages and mince pie, he said, libel actions and all that. I remembered the trouble quite distinctly too distinctly indeed, for it was a side issue into which Mrs. Marshall was always running, and which made Apps suspicious and reluctant under examination. The disappearance of the dainties on Christmas Eve from her kitchen I had always regarded as a troublesome irrelevance. So far as I had formed a judgment in that matter, at all I had gone with the general sentiment of the village, and suspected Apps and his friends, for clownish thieving of that kind was just the sort of thing that would commend itself to the rustic mind as a very good Christmas joke indeed. "'What has the mince pie got to do with the story?' I said. "'Everything,' said Wendover, and he drank, winking at me over his teacup. "'Old Franks,' said Wendover, putting his cup aside and leaning forward as he spoke to touch my knee. "'What a Franks,' I said, for I had never suspected that elderly sinner had any connection with the case. "'Drunk,' said Wendover. "'Drowsy, tipsy in the seven thorns a week ago. Discussion running high on the great mince pie and sausage question. Did Apps take him or didn't he?' Friend of Apps indignant, trying running down Mrs. Marshall. Everybody knows Mrs. Marshall's mince pies are worse than her sausages. Not worth stealing. Wouldn't have them at a gift. Ain't they, says old Franks, hiccuping and winking. That's all you know, said old Franks. Wendover paused, looked at me, and took up two slices of bread and butter, laid them face to face, bit them enormously, and looked at me again. My good man, I said, have you come all the way from Sussexville to tell me that? That and some other things, said Wendover, disposing of the bread and butter. How do you know, said Ups's friend. Never you mind, says old Franks, appearing to realize he's made a slip. 
and there in spite of a few leading questions to the old man his criticisms on mrs marshall's mincemeat came to an end well i began wait a bit said wendover when old franks had gone as he did rather quick after that the peculiar way in which he had spoken was remarked upon could it be that he had stolen the mince pie in question occasionally he did odd jobs for marshall as every one knew and it might be that some time on christmas eve he had ventured really this pothouse gossip you wait it wasn't long before this little suspicion came to my ears and i must confess i didn't think very much of it at the time nor did i connect it with your well-authenticated case who would but going past marshall's who should i see as i thought but marshall planting beans he was stooping down with his back to me so that his nether garments formed most of the view i went to the wall and shouted intending to have a quiet word with him about this missing pie and sausage he looked up and then i saw the mistake i'd made at once it wasn't marshall at all but the excellent franks doing a bit of a job in a pair of marshall's cast-off breeks ah now you sit up no men could be less alike about the head and face and complexion i'll admit but seen that way well there was really an astonishing resemblance easily be mistaken but the vicar you both of you said you saw his face so we did and heard his voice but the other gents in the case drunk dark night that staggered me for a moment i'd never thought of a mistake in the identity creeping into the case on that side i could quite imagine four drunken men making such a mistake but the point was that even if mrs marshall didn't see her husband's face overnight she did the next morning now don't you think that i've come up here with a story half told said wendover replying to this objection because i haven't i've simply settled the whole blessed question it's a concession to your weakness i know but directly the possible resemblance of old franks to marshall dawned on me i determined i would clear up the muddle from end to end i went to franks and began to talk parochialism to him and suddenly i hit him on the knee i know all about it franks my man i said own up he knew me pretty well and he looked at me for half a minute over those old glasses of his i won't tell a soul in sussexville i said i promise on my honour but how the deuce did you get out of the marshal's kitchen and him in i suppose he saw the twinkle in my eye he was in the little tool shed hard by the water butt mr wendover he said and his boots took off and put under the currant bushes as tidy as could be couldn't wake him nohow and the snow a fallen it wasn't common charity not to leave her there you see said wendover i saw only too plainly they carried home old franks thinking it was marshall while marshall was swearing and cursing his way home by the footpath over the hill and when marshall did get home mrs marshall firm in her faith that he was already safely if swinishly deposited in the kitchen let him hammer and swear at his own sweet will putting it down to apps and pulling the clothes over her head to deaden the sound unhappy marshall i said still more unhappy investigator said the curate tauntingly franks when he came to in the small hours he added thought at first that he was in heaven it shows what a conscience void of offence will do for you his last thought before losing consciousness having been that he was dying such being the effect of the cheaper spirits at the seven thorns and his first and resuming consciousness was that he was dead the moonlight was shining in through the frosty window and it was cold and spacious and clean as he'd been led to expect heaven would be and close to hand as he fumbled about were sausages and a mince pie old franks showed the usual sussex literalness my feyther's house of many mansions says i and i'm damned if i ain't in a darn good un says i was the way old franks expressed it it was only when he'd felt about and got the back door open with the idea of finding the rest of him and came upon marshall that his muddled brain began to grasp the realities of the case he recognized the outside of the house of course better than the inn the rest you infer humph <laughs> i said trying to find a flaw in his explanation it was atrociously exasperating after i'd published that report and when the society was just making so much of me he sat watching my conflict so far as my face revealed it doppelgangers he remarked unendurably i rose from my seat i caught his hat and flung it violently across the room among the spirit photographs possibly i said this and that i pitched the planchette board into the fireplace and then i attacked the available sheets of the report on crystal gazing that lay upon my desk when i had torn and crumpled several very violently i was abruptly calmed i turned and found the curate had his pipe out have you a match old chap he said with the utmost tranquillity 
I felt in my pockets and then handed him the matches from the mantel. Then, sitting down in the armchair by the fire, I took a pipe from the rack and followed his example. End of Mr. Marshall's Doppelganger The Loyalty of Esau Common by H. G. Wells This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Krista Zaleski the loyalty of esau common a fragment the native land of esau common was aurelia the head and center of that great political system the aurelian empire and he was born near the capital in the very suburbs indeed of brumosa the mightiest city in many respects that the world has ever seen and rather indiscreetly as one is apt to do in this matter he was born a lower middle-class aurelian of no particular family and less than no particular expectations of wealth or influence in life. He was born in a little room over a shop full of picture frames, and of lengths and samples of picture framing, and amidst a faint smell of glue, and his first cry, mingled with the uproar of a traction engine that was blundering along the paved suburban high street upon which the rattling sash windows of his birth chamber gave. Moreover, his father was a man whose trade had made him a vehement critic and contemner of artists, an avid reader, and, if possible, a purchaser of all books, excepting only novels and works upon art that came in his way. And these two circumstances gave certain qualities with which Providence, inexplicably careless of his social positions, had endowed our Esau a rather unusual and possibly unnatural direction. The exceptional qualities that constituted Esau's endowment resembled each other, and most other exceptional qualities, in being finally of very doubtful value to him. In most other respects they differed. One was a gift of the mind, and the second was a gift of the character. The first gift was a certain uncommon quality of imagination and intelligence, as indisputable as it is indefinable. In the dialect of the old schoolmaster, who made a precarious living by pretending to teach the tradesmen's sons in that brumosan suburb, he was quick at figures. He was also quick at drawing, though he found no other copy in the school save the schoolmaster. And, at an astonishingly early age, he grasped the fact that the practice of reading gave rewards incommeasurably great. He was a great reader, said his mother. And it was remarked by the curate who prepared him, in spite of precociously shrewd theological objections, for his first communion in the official church of the Aurelian Empire, that he was a lad of unusual intelligence. Now, unusual intelligence alone in persons of the Aurelian middle class is apt to lead tragedies. The great Aurelian Empire does not recognize the necessity of persons of unusual intelligence springing up in its lower middle class. It is an empire distinctly characterized by its eminent sense of order and decorum. It goes to inordinate costs to maintain a special class of superior persons, and for unusual intelligence to appear outside that class displays, to say the least of it, an uncivil disregard of wise and careful arrangements, somewhere. In most instances, unusual intelligence of such irregular origin is starved and ignored or at most permitted to exert itself under proper patronage in the ineffectual field of the arts. But it chanced that the tenor of the frame dealer's discourse on art in general, and his best customers in particular, gave his son an early and quite incurable bias against the practice of art in any form, while the parental collection of books gave it an equally strong bent towards the graver and more spacious interests of public affairs and this bent presently got a very definite direction to one particular public affair, the question of military methods and efficiency, by the outbreak of a small but humiliating war upon the outskirts of the Aurelian Empire, and a visit that Esau paid, just at that adolescent period when undying ambitions are begotten, to an uncle who was a butler near Blundershot, the great permanent camp of military exercises in Aurelia. Esau discovered that to think of war— to study war, to prepare and somewhere to play that mighty game, was the one supremely desirable thing in life. He might just as well have decided that his calling in life was to play cricket, 
with the fixed stars, so far as any prospect of realizing his ambition went. In the army of the Aurelian Empire at that time, there were two distinct and practically uninterchangeable sorts of soldier. There were officers and the privates. The Aurelian private soldier was almost invariably a man of the lowest class. If he was not, that was his misfortune, for he was treated as such on all occasions. Unlike the ordinary common citizen, he was supposed to be unable to read, and such scanty instruction as was given him in the art of war, there was a strong feeling in the army against privates who knew too much, was bawled at him by sergeant instructors of exceptional lung power. Under pressure from these instructors, he was compelled to pursue an ideal of soldierly smartness by cutting his hair very short, except a little lock on the brow, which he called his quiff, and greasing the roots. Popularly, he was called a swaddy, or a jimmy. Our jimmies, people would say affectionately in times of war, and bloomin' jimmies in times of peace. And his brightly conspicuous blue baize uniform was resented in all but the meanest drinking-houses and places of public resort. The public was perpetually regaled with stories and anecdotes of the amours of Jimmy, with the nurse-girl and the cook, and that women of this sort were accustomed to pay pence to Jimmy for his public company was one of the dearest legends of the great Aurelian public. The practical promotion open to Jimmy culminated in such a position as an embezzling mess clerk or as a sergeant instructor, from which altitude he might bawl even as he had been bawled at, and impose on fresh generations of Jimmies that mysterious ideal of soldierly smartness, the quiff. To become an officer was an accident too rare, too altogether dependent upon the remote opportunity coming to meet the rare gift, to enter into his ambitions. Clearly there was no way through enlistment as a private soldier, by which Isak might dream of becoming anything more than raw material in the art of war. And the officers of the Aurelian army formed an equally inaccessible class. The general public of this great empire, in spite of its inordinate pride in its imperial ascendancy, was probably as mean-souled as any public has ever been. It would not even educate its own children, but cheerfully permitted them to be trained in the sectarian schools of various proletizing bodies, to keep down the rates and instead of assiduously seeking through all its available resources for men of exceptional gifts and energy to shape and guide the military forces upon which its ascendancy finally depended, it acquiesced and indeed rejoiced in a system which amounted practically to the conversion of each of the few score undermanned regiments it maintained into a social club. Its officers were paid a mere honorarium, its subalterns received less money than if they had been tenth-rate clerks, and on the other hand, the officers' dining arrangements, their contributions to the regimental band and cursal, and their hospitalities were conceived in a spirit of magnificent profusion. It was the boast, the glory of the Aurelian army, that an officer, even with a code of honor that condoned unpaid tradesmen's bills, could not live on his pay, and consequently that its officers were gentlemen, which in Aurelia meant richly living men. The centre of regimental expenditure was the mess, and a regiment was more or less a crack regiment in just the proportion that its officers were expensive messers. This, of course, narrowed the choice of the Aurelian Empire in the matter of officers to the limited class of the rich, and even of these, the more adventurous and the more intellectual travelled or played the more exciting game of public affairs. For most of these officers' service in that army was not regarded as an arduous profession but as a way of passing the time, and with the natural disinclination of prosperous people to risk brain pressure, it was regarded as a breach of good manners among them to talk shop. The Aurelians were very proud of the class of officers, at once showy, impressive, and inexpensive, that was obtained in this way, and it was believed as firmly that Jimmy would not serve under a man who was not a gentleman, as that he was tipped pennies by servant girls and certainly only young men with a taste for bright blue bays and servants' girls' pennies, and acting as waiters in a class club, were very urgently tempted, in peaceful times at any rate, to enter the Aurelian army. Now, as Esau's father was a man of small means, Esau was no sort of gentleman at all, and the mere whisper of him becoming an officer in the army would have sent every friend and relation he possessed into inextinguishable laughter, 
they would have yelled with laughter at the idea of the profession of arms being a remunerative calling it would have seemed to these singular people as funny as apprenticing a boy to a duke so esau when his school days were over became a clerk and afterwards turned the fruits of his father's library to the business of journalism and the aurelian army did not visibly suffer in the slightest degree for the loss of that exceptional intelligence and imagination of his the empire was at peace and not a mess entertainment but was the brighter for the absence of esau's no doubt vulgar manners his not very cheerful face and the inglorious parsimony his presence would have entailed but as i said esau had not one exceptional gift but two and the second was that queer set of elements in the will that make a man dogged he could see obstacles at times he saw them big but he could not see impossibilities he was interested in the art of war he wanted to play that game it was not the outward show of soldiering captivated him not the band and the uniform not the effect of the mess glories on the feminine mind nor the tramp 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 all of which elements indeed seemed to him rather boring accessories but the real thing and because he could not be a professional soldier he did not propose to bury his ambition out of sight and turn to other things at any rate there was nothing to prevent him studying thinking about dreaming about and if necessary experimenting about this great actuality so the reading of his early manhood was all of campaigns and theories his holidays led him wherever military exercises were in progress and for a time under the immediate command of a wholesale draper and the remote control of a superseded lieutenant colonel of the regular army he studied thirst and hunger banked holiday crowds and the thinnest sham of sham fighting as a volunteer in time esau came to know quite a lot about war to feel even that he could imagine what it might be when the next war came at the very first he had come to this matter with a vague suspicion that the aurelian army was not the supreme expression of human science and forethought and as his knowledge grew his suspicion expanded into a conviction that partly by reason of the base parsimony of the aurelian taxpayer and the dodgy incapacity of the statesman he favoured and partly by reason of the aggressive exclusiveness of the aurelian wealthy who would rather see a thing not done than have it done by a low-class fellow-countryman the aurelian army was about as inefficient and inadequate a fighting machine as any empire in the world except perhaps the chinese had ever tempted providence by maintaining it was undermanned it was stupidly officered its economy was controlled by civilian clerks who knew nothing of war and cared less its drill was fifty years out of date it was short of horses and devoid of transport and he became more and more convinced that nothing but a miracle could save it from overwhelming disaster if it ever came into collision with either the army of Celteria or that of Barbarossa, Aurelia's great rivals in the world. Not, indeed, that either of these armies struck Esau as being exceptionally efficient or incapable of disaster, but they outclassed the Aurelian force quite hopelessly for all that. Now this realization distressed Esau very much. Aurelia was a splendid and spacious empire, with a glorious language and literature and a gallant history, even if it lacked gallant taxpayers. And Esau's pride in his race and nationality was, to begin with, an almost religious passion. And here, marring his pride and darkening his future for him, he perceived more and more clearly this flaw upon its glories. The thing kept him awake at night, and by day it distressed him to the pitch of perpetually wanting to do something, and never being able to get that something done in a satisfactory manner. He wrote letters, letters to influential military people, who did not answer him, or snubbed him pitilessly. He wrote letters to papers that made him seem a conceited and jealous detractor of happily placed officials. He wrote articles that he found it very hard to get printed, or that finally got themselves torn up again in a fit of unpatriotic pique. He tainted the little reputation he had made as a journalist by his attentions to this topic. His chief editor had to stipulate that when Esau wrote articles about this and that, he should not go dragging in the army grievance, and Cockshot, the humorous writer and talker, added, "'Hello, Common. What's the Aurelian officer done now?' to his collection of daily jests. To which Esau usually answered, "'Nothing.' 
and when his patriotic ardor began to cool under the discovery of his absolute insignificance in the Aurelian scheme of things, another passion grew to replace it, and that was the exasperation of a man who believes in his own capacity and finds it universally denied, who finds his life slipping past him with no chance, with no shadow of an opportunity to prove him more than a windy contemptor of his superiors. By three and thirty he was a bitter man. His birthday fell on the great Aurelian bank holiday, when all over the country that volunteer force which was the Aurelian excuse for avoiding conscription did what were called manoeuvres. By habit or accident he found himself walking in the pine woods near Blundershot, the great Aurelian camp of arms. He had come upon a battalion in the shape of a straggling crowd, standing and firing a volley at two hundred yards, preparatory to delivering a bayonet charge. And fleeing this horrid vision, he had come upon another massing, apparently to receive shrapnel at seven hundred yards. Finally his luck had brought him out upon the crest of a hill, from which the final march past was to be seen, dim and far away through the dense clouds of dust. He sat down upon a gate, and watched the dark masses shape about and move, and every now and then the warm breeze brought the strains of their numerous excellent, and totally unnecessary, bands to his ears. There were over twenty thousand men away there, infantry, in battalions that invariably fell short of their full strength. There were a squadron or so of cavalry, half a battery, a machine-gun section or so, and twenty-nine men with bicycles. The entire force had no means of supply nor transport whatever. It was fed by a wholesale grocery firm that supplied its own carts, and whatever survivors a month of campaigning might leave of it were bound by every arrangement to be bootless and in rags, unless the enemy supplied them in the prisoner's enclosure. Esau's emotions took form at last in words. He misapplied his condemnation. "'You fools!' he said, addressing the collected masses. A voice answered him, a voice with a faintly foreign accent. "'Peace advocate, I presume?' Esau turned and discovered a grey golf cap, a bronzed nose, and a red moustache. The golf cap, lifted, disclosed a pair of keen grey eyes. "'Not a bit of it,' said Esau. "'Well,' said the stranger, argumentatively. "'They'd be about as much good in a fight,' said Esau, "'as a Hyde Park demonstration.' "'Looks pretty stocky stuff, some of it,' said the stranger. Esau made no direct reply. "'There's a point,' he said, "'where courage becomes lunacy. "'A man who seriously proposes "'to go into a campaign as a volunteer soldier "'under the Aurelian War Office "'is either sick of his life or an idiot.' "'Studied the question?' "'A little,' said Esau. "'What's wrong?' "'He had opened the floodgates.' everything said esau and assumed a more comfortable position on his gait for example the stranger struck esau as a person of unparalleled intelligence he did not simply listen he punctuated esau's remarks with brief intelligent sentences of appreciation in the first place explained esau this volunteer army has not one tenth of the guns it ought to have it has no cavalry it has no transport and no stores in a country abounding in horses there is no organization for registering and using the national stock of horse flesh for transport, and it wears unserviceable uniforms. It is indeed a mere costly and inefficient emergency apparatus for filling up infantry battalions in the regular army that ought never to need filling. Its drill is obsolete. Drill, cried Esau. They haven't begun to drill. All they can do is march up and down in lines and files and masses and shoot at targets. Those crowds there couldn't fight. They're only organized for processions. And a sort of deadly rioting in savage lands. We haven't such a thing as a fighting regiment in the world. The stranger sought explanations. He saw expanded. The first thing a battalion should be taught to do, he said, is surely to fight in a battle. There's three principal things in that section. To learn to advance. To learn to stick tight and tackle in advance. And what's hardest and most necessary to learn to move back fighting. As for the last, they haven't dreamt it's possible. The others they play at at odd times. But just imagine what a battalion might be that was trained, say as well as a second-rate football club, to play up and stiffen and come back and rally. Why not? It isn't done anywhere. I know, said Esau, but it might be. It's all the fighting they want to know. You know, 
now and if they learn it at the price of marching ragged on parade what does it matter and the next thing they want to know every man of them and the whole lot collectively is just how to keep their little stomachs in order and their feet clean and tidy over all sorts of ground his voice thickened with indignation they shy our poor devils of jimmies he cried into wildernesses of mud up icy mountains into hot deserts they send them where there is nothing but putrid water to drink and with emergency rations for three days ahead clamouring to be eaten or thrown away and never till the war comes do they give them a haport of training in judgment or self-restraint you know the fighting and warfare is nothing to the other thing the travelling that's the principal thing an army does in war it moves about but until this army of ours is actually in a war it never moves itself a bit it squats in barracks while its officers give entertainments and play cricket and polo and half the men in each skeleton battalion are trotting about doing housework and washing up and all that but you know if every one connected with this army was not a cursed fool it would burn its barracks and march where everywhere all around the aurelian empire in carts on horses or bicycles bicycles for preference this army should go battalions full up rationed armed guns and everything ready to fight in bad weather always rough on it not a bit of it it's the barracks are hell for soldiers it's the dread of barracks keeps decent men out of the army it's the barracks that make one man in twelve desert the suicides at blundershot are proverbial they'd learn soon enough how not to let marching be rough on them they'd see the world think of the sort of recruits they'd get for a bicycle tour round the empire with the off chance of fighting like football eh they'd rope in something better than the lout who wants a blazing uniform because of the girls and has to be trained to sight his rifle by command just think of it beautiful regiments of brown hard-seasoned men with sound feet and sound insides and all their stuff compactly with them all of them knowing just what to do and just how to do it think of em going off white and young southeast and coming back hard and brown out of the west eh everlastingly but there must be a reason began the red-haired man the reason is why the army is a social institution where'd the hunt be where'd the band be how about the annual sports no tennis for em no cricket think above all of the wives of the titled officers esau expanded still further he poured out the bitterness of his soul upon the strange ordering of things that made warfare the privilege of a particular class the honour of soldiering a prerequisite of wealth he admitted to this stranger the tragedy of his thwarted ambitions with that freedom and intimacy that is sometimes so much more possible with strangers than it is even with our nearest friends the red-haired man meditated upon him i too was born an aurelian he said at last but now life was too strictly defined in this country for my father he did not like that state unto which it had pleased god to call him and as sticking in that state is one of the fundamental articles of religion here at home he went to marantha where they have a different creed i was sixteen years old then and now i am a maranthian esau looked at him with a new interest for marantha was a curiously situated country sunken as it were between encircling arms of the aurelian empire and threatened it was openly said in both countries by that process of expansion that seemed to be the aurelian destiny but he said don't you find that mix your sympathies a little the maranthian shook his head you don't feel yourself an aurelian not a bit of it why should i you can come back to the land where you spent all the impressionable years of your life and feel a foreigner the red-haired man looked at the dusty regiments away there and smiled up at esau don't you he asked not a bit of it where do you come in esau looked interrogation they don't want you said the red-haired man they will said esau not very confidently not a bit of it they'd rather run their empire on the rocks and scuttle it than take help from a common man like you what is it they call you he hesitated bounder suggested esau yes that's the word bounder outsider poor man not in the know esau stared at the distant march past the red-haired man pursued his advantage your empire he said did it bother to educate you i did my learning in a national school there you are the empire didn't want you it handed you over to a society of pious people and let him bring you up on charity and cheap teachers 
to their own particular brand of piety, eh? It paid the very least it could for you. It only did that out of shame. It treated you as bad men treat their bastards. And afterwards? Esau took a higher line. One gives to the empire. It's a duty, not a charity. They won't let you give. Keep out of it, you low-class brute. That's the empire's compliments to you. Let our officer boys of the proper class learn war, with your blood, and take your gifts to hell. Has it ever spoken differently to you? Esau straddled his gate defensively. The day will come, he said. When you will die and be buried, said the red-haired man. Since the Ironsides faded from the world, they've run no risks of men of your sort getting their hands on the machines. They came upon a pause. Now, in Marantha, said the red-haired man, as though he spoke aloud, a good soldier is a good soldier, wherever he was born. Esau did not answer. Why should you not go to Marantha, said the red-haired man, suddenly firing point-blank. What does Marantha want with soldiers? asked Esau. It wants them, anyhow, said the red-haired man, and it sees that it gets them. Why? To prepare for war is to avoid it. Not always. It is the best. What possible country could Marantha fight? The red-haired man shrugged his shoulders. I am an Aurelian, said Esau. The country does not admit it, said the red-haired man. It lets me live here. Like any other foreigner. You have no more to do with official Aurelia than with official Barbarossa or official Solteria. In the language of polite society, you don't exist. Now, in Marantha, you can exist just as much as you see proper. Esau shook his head, and the red-haired man, being a man of tact, presently passed to other things. And when they parted, he saw that they exchanged addresses, and Esau discovered that his interlocutor was Commandant Thomas Smith in that army of Marantha that never dreamt of fighting. And in the night Esau lay awake, turning over many spacious issues. At first the matter of his thoughts was intensely personal. Then it became political. And finally that specialist side of him got the upper hand. If ever that war came, if, after all, Marantha should fight, what possible chances could Marantha hope for? Suddenly he began to discover chances. In the morning he found his brain had got that problem forward to a very interesting stage. He devoured his breakfast and went out and bought as good a selection of maps of Marantha and portions of Marantha as Brumosa could afford him. And for some days his income as a journalist was in suspense, as he studied this more congenial theme. If, after all, he said, they should try and make an army on these lines. By Jove, cried Esau, if they do that, they will beat us. He stood up, smitten to the heart by a vision. If I had the making of this army, he cried, it would be the finest war. When he had studied the country, he came to the army that Aurelia would have to fight in that country. But Aurelia possessed very little information about the army of Marantha. In the current number of a high-class review, however, Esau found a curious article on Marantha by a gentleman of position whose gist was this, that the Maranthians, who had once been excellent sharpshooters, could now no longer shoot. Now I wonder what he and his relatives have been talking about, said Esau, and presently found himself hunting for further information. He discovered himself short of ready money. He was not the sort of man who keeps a big current account. So he drew on some reserves, declined some new journalistic work that offered, and set himself to pursue these unsuspected chances for the Maranthians that had dawned upon him in the middle of the night. He meditated upon Commandant Thomas Smith until that gentleman assumed something of a legendary quality in his memory. He chanced upon a paragraph in an evening paper, a not very conspicuous paragraph, referring to certain custom-house difficulties that had arisen with Marantha. It's nothing, said Isa, after thrice reading the paragraph. It's the sort of little hitch that might happen at any time. And the next day he had a visit from Commandant Thomas Smith. Common came through the folding doors between his bedroom and his living room to discover Commandant Smith standing near the window, pulling his red moustache and affecting to be unaware of the maps, sketches, and memoranda that littered the writing table. Well, said Commandant Smith. Well, said Esau. Have you thought it over? As a problem, yes, a good deal. As a personal problem? No, as a problem in the art of war. That follows later. How about yourself? I'm an Aurelian, said Esau, and took down his tobacco and pipe. 
Commandant Smith sat down. Cigarette, said Esau, and handed tobacco and papers. Commandant Smith reopened his attack. He developed his theory of the Aurelian Empire with patient elaboration. What I want to do, he said, is to clear away this delusion of yours that you belong to this empire, or that it belongs to you in any sort of way whatever. This empire is a plutocratic officialdom, supported by constituencies of fools. You don't come in anywhere. You're a lodger. I don't suppose you even vote. I didn't last election, admitted Esau. The Liberals put up a Jew, and the Conservatives put up a railway barrister, and I don't like either sort. Commandant Smith claimed the point by a gesture. All the same, said Esau. I'm an Aurelian. Commandant Smith restated his case. I'm an Aurelian, said Esau. Now look here, said Smith, and meditated for a moment with his eye on the heap of maps. You persist in thinking you are an Aurelian. Very well. I will tell you now what everyone in Marantha believes, that your upper-class people here mean to pick a quarrel with us, wholly and solely to annex us, not with any friendly desire for unity, but simply that they may give us the benefit of that same tight system of exclusive class government, supported by a sham of party elections, that keeps everything here—schools, army, trade—in a state of such amazing efficiency. Well, we don't want those blessings. We've an old rascal as president, but anyhow we've got checks on him. On the whole we don't do so badly. We think the Republican idea is something worth fighting for. And so we are getting ready to fight. I will tell you presently, in honest round figures, just what we count upon in men, material, and support. Of course, I shall give you no proofs. I shall just tell you. At present they do not know that we are getting ready to fight. They do not know how we mean to fight. They know nothing of our resources and nothing of our temper. I don't believe that a single person in authority here has taken the trouble to mug these maps you have there for half an hour. They do not even know whom they will send against us. He paused. Well, said Esau. Well, said Commandant Smith, as you are so sure you are an Aurelian, you are one of those who are going to make war upon us. Get ready to do it. Hunt up the whole question, study the game till you know it like your hand. When you know it all, tell them. Offer to help them, anyhow. Volunteer. I know for a fact that they are going to fight us with forty thousand men. Esau turned on him quickly. They are, I tell you. You know better. Tell them it can't be done. You can do anything with forty thousand men. Not jimmies in bright blue bays under amateurs who think they are professionals and short of horses and guns. But that's beside the mark. I give you leave to play the loyal Aurelian for a year. Get to work. Try and set your country to make use of what you know and what you can do. Give yourself. Don't ask for pay. Well, and when the year is up, if Aurelia will have nothing of you— I will serve another year, said Esau Common. Commandant Smith made a movement of impatience. He turned in his chair, and his voice went up to the note of irritation. Confound it, he shouted. Don't you see that all this is not loyalty to Aurelia? It's simply a stupid self-devotion to this privileged governing class. Do you think we should object to union if we might come in fair and equal? Not a bit of it. But we know they don't mean to bring us in fair and equal. They mean to walk over us and treat us as they treat you. Ha, ha, soldiers and gentlemen bossing everything, muddling everything, spoiling our railways, spoiling our trade, snubbing all our promise, breaking our hearts with a few money-lenders here and there to help them. That's part of their pretty ways. They will insult any good white man who isn't and doesn't want to be rich. They will truckle to any nigger who understands twenty per cent. Your colonies in Columbia wouldn't stand it. You wouldn't stand it if you hadn't to do so. You know you'd barricade the streets of Bermosa tomorrow if you got your hands on the guns, and were sure the Barbarossa and the Saltarian people would stand off while you settled them. Only you're so thundering loyal and politic. You hate em, and so do we. We won't have em in Marantha. We will burn our towns first. We'll make our country a desert before we stand that. Better be shot than stifled. It's no war against Aurelia. It's a class war. Yes. And so was the revolt of your colonies in Columbia a hundred years ago. They don't think it was now. They've jabbered the truth away. But the Columbia War of Independence was just a war against privilege, and so is this. And what a man of your class has to do on the side of privilege. I'm an Aurelian, said Esau. You're a fool, said Smith. 
and drummed impatient fingers on the table. "'Try that for a year, anyhow,' said Smith. "'I'll try it for two, said Esau. "'And then?' "'Still Aurelian,' said Common. Smith stood up. "'Here is the address of an agent of mine,' he said. "'Whenever you want your passage to Marantha, he'll give it you.' He hesitated with the card in his hand. "'Even if the war has begun. "'Of course, this address, at any rate, is confidential.' "'Of course,' said Esau. "'But I shan't come for all that.' "'My dear man, your country will be licked into a cocked hat, and then it will hump its back and say no thank you to a man of your sort. They'll make a ninth-class kingdom like Portugal of this empire before they let your sort in. They'll put a Jew or a Gilchrist nigger in before they let you in. You're the uttermost foreigner. You're a lower middle-class Aurelian. And then you—ugh!' And Smith turned himself about to find his hat. So soon as Smith had left him, Esau set his brains to work to demonstrate his loyalty to the country that was his own. He had a vision of a great series of articles on the national military inefficiency that he would write, articles of such capable and pitiless demonstration that it would be impossible for any sane person to deny the necessity of reform, and of reform in the direction that he would indicate. Variorum copies of these articles still exist in manuscript. Three even reach type. They were sent to prominent magazines. They went as letters to politicians. The burthen of them all was that the army was bad, officers ignorant and untrained, men ignorant and untrained, arms defective, staff defective, ill-reading for Aurelian eyes. It became evident Esau was a pro-Maranthian. One scheme Esau proposed for the brigading of volunteers was adopted without acknowledgment in a mangled form by the war office and a well-connected colonel patented one of Esau's suggestions for transport vehicles. The rest of his criticism and proposals were as the voice of one whose head is in a sack. And meanwhile the slow interchange of diplomacy broadened that little issue between Marantha and Aurelia. That little difficulty of the Custom House added to itself other difficulties, and still other difficulties, until the Marantha question had clamoured from obscure corner paragraphs in the newspapers to the possession of a daily column, and until that column had shifted from position to position, until it was the dominant column every day. Here the fragment ends. The impossibility of keeping up the tone of careless geniality dawned upon the author. H. G. Wells End of The Loyalty of Esau Common This recording is in the public domain. My First Airplane by H. G. Wells this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Krista Zaleski. My First Airplane My first airplane! What vivid memories of youth that recalls! Far back it was, in the spring of 1912, that I acquired Aluda Magna, the Great Lark, for so I christened her and I was then a slender young man of four-and-twenty, with hair, beautiful blonde hair, all over my adventurous young head. I was a dashing young fellow, enough, in spite of the slight visual defect that obliged me to wear spectacles on my prominent aquiline, but by no means shapeless nose, the typical flyer's nose. I was a good runner and swimmer, a vegetarian as ever, an all-wooler, and an ardent advocate of the extremist views in every direction about everything precious little in the way of a movement got started that I wasn't in. I owned two motor bicycles, and an enlarged photograph of me at that remote date, in leather skullcap, goggles, and gauntlets, still adorns my study fireplace. I was also a great flyer of war kites, and a voluntary scoutmaster of high repute. From the first beginnings of the boom in flying, therefore, I was naturally eager for the fray. I chafed against the tears of my widowed mother for a time, and at last told her I could endure it no longer. If I'm not the first to fly in Mintonchester, I said, I leave Mintonchester. I'm your own son, Mummy, and that's me. And it didn't take me a week to place my order when she agreed. I found one of the old price lists the other day in a drawer, full of queer woodcuts of still queerer contrivances. What a time that was! An incredulous world had at last consented to believe that it could fly and in addition to the motor-car people and the bicycle people and so on a hundred new unheard-of firms were turning out airplanes of every size and pattern to meet the demand 
Amazing prices they got for them, too. 350 was cheap for the things. I find 450, 500, 500 guineas in this list of mine. And many as capable of flight as oak trees. They were sold, too, without any sort of guarantee, and with the merest apology for instruction. Some of the early airplane companies paid nearly 200% on their ordinary shares in those early years. How well I remember the dreams I had, and the doubts. The dreams were all of wonder in the air. I saw myself rising gracefully from my mother's paddock, clearing the hedge at the end, circling up to get over the viker's pear trees, and away between the church steeple and the rise of Withicombe, towards the marketplace. Lord, how they would stare to see me. Young Mr. Betts again, they would say. We knew he'd do it. I would circle and perhaps wave a handkerchief, and then I meant to go over Lupton's gardens to the grounds of Sir Digby Foster. There a certain fair Denzian might glance from the window. Ah, youth! Youth! My doubts were all of the make I should adopt, the character of the engines I should choose. I remember my wild rush on my motorbike to London, to see the things and give my order. The day of muddy traffic dodging as I went from one shop to another, my growing exasperation at hearing everywhere the same refrain, sold out, can't undertake to deliver before the beginning of April. Not me. I got a Luda Magna at last at a little place in Blackfriars Road. She was an order thrown on the firm's hands at the eleventh hour by the death of the purchaser through another maker, and I ran my modest bank account into an overdraft to get her. To this day I won't confess the price I paid for her. Poor little mumsy. Within a week she was in my mother's paddock, being put together after transport by a couple of not-too-intelligent mechanics. The joy of it! And a sort of adventurous tremulousness. I'd had no lessons. All the qualified teachers were booked up at stupendous fees for months ahead. But it wasn't in my quality to stick at a thing like that. I couldn't have endured three days' delay. I assured my mother I had had lessons, for her peace of mind. It is a poor son who will not tell a lie to keep his parent happy. I remember the exultant turmoil of walking round the thing as it grew into a credible shape, with the consciousness of half Mintonchester peering at me through the hedge, only deterred by our new trespass board, and the disagreeable expression of Snape, our trusted gardener, who was partly mowing the grass and partly on the sentry go with his scythe, from swarming into the meadow. I lit a cigarette and watched the workmen sagely and we engaged an elderly unemployed named Snorticombe to keep watch all night to save the thing from meddlers. In those days, you must understand, an airplane was a sign and a wonder. Alada Magna was a darling for her time, though nowadays I suppose she would be received with derisive laughter by every schoolboy in the land. She was a monoplane, and roughly speaking, a Blariot, and she had the dearest, neatest seven-cylinder, forty-horsepower GKC engine, with its GBS flywheel, that you can possibly imagine. I spent an hour or so turning her up. She had a deafening purr, rather like a machine gun in action, until the Viker sent round to say that he was writing a sermon upon peace, and was unable to concentrate his mind on the topic until I desisted. I took his objection in good part, and, after a culminating volley of one last lingering look, started for a stroll around the town. In spite of every endeavour to be modest, I could not but feel myself the sinister of every eye. I had rather carelessly forgotten to change the leggings and breeches I had bought for the occasion, and I was also wearing my leather skull-cap with ear-flaps carelessly adjusted, so that I could hear what people were saying. I should think I had half the population under fifteen at my heels before I was halfway down the high street. "'You going to fly, Mr. Betts?' says one cheeky youngster. "'Like a bird,' I said. "'Don't you fly till we comes out of school,' says another. It was a sort of royal progress that evening for me. I visited old Lupton, the horticulturist, and he could hardly conceal what a great honour he thought it. He took me over his new greenhouse— he had now got, he said, three acres of surface under glass, and showed me all sorts of clever dodges he was adopting in the way of intensive culture, and afterwards we went down to the end of his old flower garden and looked at his bees. When I came out, my retinue of kids was still waiting for me, reinforced. 
Then it went round by paramours, and dropped into the bull and horses, just as if there wasn't anything particular up, for a lemon squash. Everybody was talking about my airplane. They just shut up for a moment when I came in, and then burst out with questions. It's odd nowadays to remember all that excitement. I answered what they had to ask me, and refrained from putting on any side, and afterwards Mrs. Flightman and I went into the commercial room, and turned over the pages of various illustrated journals, and compared the pictures with my machine in a quiet, unassuming sort of way. Everybody encouraged me to go up. Everybody. I lay stress on that, because, as I was soon to discover, the tides and ebbs of popular favour are among the most inexplicable and inconsistent things in the world. I particularly remember old Cheeseman, the pork butcher, whose pigs I killed, saying over and over again, in a tone of perfect satisfaction, You won't have any difficulty in going up, you won't. There won't be any difficulty about going up. And winking and nodding to the other eminent tradesmen there assembled, I hadn't much difficulty in going up. A lot of Magna was a cheerful lifter, and the roar and spin of her engine had hardly begun behind me, before she was off her wheels. Snap, snap, they came up above the ski gliders, and swaying swiftly across the meadows towards the vicarage hedge. She had a sort of onward roll to her, rather like the movement of a corpulent but very buoyant woman. I had just a glimpse of brave little mother, trying not to cry and full of pride in me, on the veranda, with both the maids and old Snape beside her, and then I had to give all my attention to the steering wheel if I didn't want to barge into the viker's pear-trees. I'd felt the faintest of tugs just as I came up, and fancied I heard a resounding whack on our new trespassers will be prosecuted board, and I saw the crowd of people in the lane running this way and that from my loud humming approach. But it was only after the flight was over that I realized what that fool Snorticombe had been up to. It would seem he had thought the monster needed tethering. I won't attempt to explain the mysteries of his mind and he had tied about a dozen yards of rope to the end of either wing, and fixed them firmly to a couple of iron guy-posts that belonged properly to the badminton net. Up they came at the tug of the Aluda, and now they were trailing and dancing and leaping along behind me, and taking the most vicious dives and lunges at everything that came within range of them. Poor old Templecombe got it hottest in the lane, I'm told, a frightful whack on his bald head, and then we ripped up the viker's cucumber frames, killed and scattered his parrot, smashed the upper pane of his study window, and just missed the housemaid as she stuck her head out of the upper bedroom window. I didn't, of course, know anything of this at the time. It was on a lower plane altogether from my proceedings. I was steering past his vicarage, a narrow miss, and trying to come round to clear the pear trees at the end of the garden, which I did with a scrace and the trailers behind me sent leaves and branches flying this way and that. I had reason to thank heaven for my sturdy little GKCs. Then I was fairly up for a time. I found it much more confusing than I had expected. The engine made such an infernal whirr for one thing, and the steering tugged and struggled like a thing alive. But I got her heading over the marketplace all right. We buzzed over stunts the green grocers and my trailers hopped up his back premises and made a sanguinary mess of the tiles on his roof, and sent an avalanche of broken chimney-pot into the crowded street below. Then the thing dipped. I suppose one of the guy-posts tried to anchor for a second in Stunt's rafters, and I had the hardest job to clear the bull and horse stables. I didn't, as a matter of fact, completely clear them. The ski-like alighting runners touched the ridge for a moment, and the left wing bent against the top of the chimney-stack and floundered over it in an awkward, destructive manner. I'm told that my trailers whirled about the crowded marketplace in the most diabolical fashion, as I dipped and recovered, but I'm inclined to think all this part of the story has been greatly exaggerated. Nobody was killed, and I couldn't have been half a minute from the time I appeared over stunts to the time when I slid off the stable roof and in among Lupton's glass. If people had taken reasonable care of themselves instead of gaping at me, they wouldn't have got hurt. I had enough to do without pointing out to people that they were likely to be hit by an iron guy-post which had seen fit to follow me. If anyone ought to have warned them, it was that fool Snorticum. Indeed, what with the incalculable damage done to the left wing, 
and one of the cylinders getting out of rhythm and making an ominous catch in the whirr, I was busy enough for anything on my own private personal account. I suppose I am, in a manner of speaking, responsible for knocking old Dudney off the station bus, but I don't see that I can be held answerable for the subsequent evolutions of the bus, which ended after a charge among the market stalls in Cheeseman's shop window. Nor do I see that I am to blame because an idle and ill-disciplined crowd chose to stampede across a stock of carelessly distributed earthenware and overturned a butter stall. I was a mere excuse for all this misbehavior. I didn't exactly fall into Lupton's glass, and I didn't exactly drive over it. I think Ricocheting describes my passage across his premises as well as any single word can. It was the queerest sensation, being carried along by this big, buoyant thing, which had, as it were, bolted with me, and feeling myself alternately lifted up and then dropped with a scrunch upon a fresh greenhouse roof, in spite of all my efforts to get control, and the infinite relief when at last at the fifth or sixth pounce I rose, and kept on rising. I seemed to forget everything disagreeable instantly. The doubt whether, after all, a Luda Magna was good for flying vanished. She was evidently very good. We whirred over the wall at the end, with my trailer still bumping behind, and beyond one of them hitting a cow which died the next day. I don't think I did the slightest damage to anything or anybody, all across the breadth of Cheeseman's Meadow. Then I began to rise, steadily but surely, and getting the thing well in hand, came swooping round over the piggeries to give Mintonchester a second taste of my quality. I meant to go up in a spiral until I was clear of all the trees and things, and circle about the church spire. Hitherto I had been so concentrated on the plunges and tugs of the monster I was driving, and so deafened by the uproar of my engine, that I had noticed little of the things which were going on below. But now I could make out a little lot of people, headed by Lupton with a garden fork, rushing obliquely across the corner of Cheeseman's Meadow. It puzzled me for a second to imagine what they could think they were after. Up I went, whirring and swaying, and presently got a glimpse down High Street, of the awful tangle everything had got into in the marketplace. I didn't at the time connect that extraordinary smash-up with my transit. It was the jar of my whack against the weathercock that really stopped my engines. I've never been able to make out quite how it was I hit the unfortunate vein. Perhaps the twist I had given my left wing on Stunt's roof spoilt my steering. But anyhow, I hit the gaudy thing and bent it, and for a lengthy couple of seconds I wasn't by any means sure whether I wasn't going to dive straight down into the marketplace. I got her right by a supreme effort. I think the people I didn't smash might have squeezed out one drop of gratitude for that. Drove, pitching at the treetops of the Withycombe, got round, and realized the engines were stopping. There wasn't any time to survey the country and arrange for a suitable landing place. There wasn't any chance of clearing the course. It wasn't my fault if a quarter of the population of Mintonchester was swarming out over Cheeseman's Meadows. It was the only chance I had to land without a smash, and I took it. Down I came, a steep glide doing the best I could for myself. Perhaps I did bowl a few people over, but progress is progress. And I had to kill his pigs. It was a case of either dropping among the pigs and breaking my rush, or going full tilt into the corrugated iron piggeries beyond. I might have been cut to ribbons, and pigs are born to die. I stopped and stood up stiffly on the framework and looked behind me. It didn't take me a moment to realize that Mintonchester meant to take my poor efforts to give it an aviation day all to itself in a spirit of ferocious ingratitude. The air was full of the squealing of the two pigs I had pinned under my machine, and the bawling of the nearest spectators. Lupton occupied the middle distance with a garden fork, with the evident intention of jabbing it into my stomach. I am always pretty cool and quick-witted in an emergency. I dropped off poor Aluda Magna like a shot, dodged through the piggery, went up by Frobisher's orchard, nipped over the yard wall of Hink's cottages, and was into the police station by the back way before anyone could get within fifty feet of me. Hello, said Inspector Nenton. Smashed the thing? No, I said. 
but people seem to have got something the matter with them. I want to be locked in a cell. For a fortnight, do you know, I wasn't allowed to come near my own machine. I went home from the police station as soon as the first excitement had blown over a little, going round by Love Lane and the chart, so as not to arouse any febrile symptoms. I found Mother frightfully indignant. You can be sure at the way I had been treated. And there, as I say, was I, standing a sort of siege in the upstairs rooms, a sturdy little Aloda Magna away in Cheeseman's fields, being walked round and stared at by everybody in the world but me. Cheeseman's theory was that he had seized her. There came a gale one night, and the dear thing was blown clean over the hedge among Lupton's greenhouses again. And then Lupton set round a silly note to say that if we didn't remove her, she would be sold to defray expenses, going off into a long tirade about damages and his solicitor. So Mother posted off to Clamps, the furniture removers, at Up Norton Corner, and they got hold of a timber wagon, and popular feeling had allayed sufficiently before that arrived for me to go in person to superintend the removal. There she lay like a great moth above the debris of some cultural projects of Lupton's, scarcely damaged herself except for a hole or so, and some bent rods and stays in the left wing and a smashed skid. But she was bespattered with pig's blood, and pretty dirty. I went at once by instinct for the engines, and had them in perfect going order before the timber wagon arrived. A sort of popularity returned to me with the procession home. With the help of a swarm of men we got a lewd a magna poised on the wagon, and then I took my seat to see she balanced properly, and a miscellaneous team of seven horses started to tow her home. It was nearly one o'clock when we got to that, and all the children turned out to shout and jeer. We couldn't go by Pook's Lane and the vicarage because the walls were too high and narrow and so we headed across Cheeseman's Meadows for Stokes Waste, and the Common, to get round by that detour. I was silly, of course, to do what I did, I see that now. But sitting up there on my triumphal car, with all the multitude about me, excited me. I got a kind of glory on. I really only meant to let the propeller spin as a sort of hurrahing. But I was carried away. Was It was like something blowing up. And behold, I was sailing and plunging away from my wain across the common for a second flight. Lord, I said, I fully meant to run up the air a little way, come about and take her home to our paddock. But those early aeroplanes were very uncertain things. After all, it wasn't such a very bad shot to land in the vicarage garden. And that practically is what I did. And I don't see that it was my fault that all the vicarage and a lot of friends should be having lunch on the lawn. They were doing that, of course, so as to be on the spot, without having to rush out of the house when Aluda Magna came home again. Quiet exultation, that was their game. They wanted to gloat over every particular of my ignominious return. You can see that from the way they had arranged the table. I can't help it if fate decided that my return wasn't to be so ignominious as all that, and swooped me down on the lot of them. They were having their soup. They had calculated on me for the dessert, I suppose. To this day I can't understand how it is I didn't kill the vicar. The forward end of the left wing got him just under the chin and carried him back a dozen yards. He must have had neck vertebrae like steel, and even then I was amazed his head didn't come off. Perhaps he was holding on underneath, but I can't imagine where. If it hadn't been for the fascination of his staring face— I think I could have avoided the veranda. But as it was, that took me by surprise. That was a fair crumple up. The wood must have just rotted away under its green paint. But anyhow, it and the climbing roses and the shingles above, and everything snapped and came down like stage scenery. And I and the engines and the middle part drove clean through the French windows onto the drawing-room floor. It was jolly lucky for me, I think, that the French windows weren't shut. There's no unpleasanter way of getting hurt in the world than flying suddenly through thin window glass. And I think I ought to know. There was a frightful jobation, but the vicar was out of action. That was one good thing. Those deep, sonorous sentences. But perhaps they would have calmed things. That was the end of Aluda Magna, my first airplane. I never even troubled to take her away. I hadn't the heart to. And then the storm burst. 
the idea seems to have been to make mother and me pay for everything that had ever tumbled down or got broken in mintonchester since the beginning of things oh and for any animal that had ever died a sudden death in the memory of the oldest inhabitant the tariff ruled high too cows were twenty-five to thirty pounds and upward pigs about a pound each with no reduction for killing a quantity verandas verandas were steady at forty-five guinea dinner services too were up and so were tiling and all branches of the building trade it seemed to certain persons in mintonchester i believe that an era of unexampled prosperity had dawned upon the place only limited in fact by the solvency of me and mother the vicar tried the old sold to defray expenses racket but i told him he might sell i pleaded defective machinery and the hand of god did my best to shift the responsibility on to the firm in blackfriars road and as an additional precaution filed my petition from bankruptcy i really hadn't any property in the world thanks to mother's goodness except my two motor bicycles which the roots took my photographic dark room and a lot of bound books on aeronautics and progress generally mother of course wasn't responsible she hadn't lifted a wing well for all that disagreeables piled up so heavily on me what with being shouted after by a ragtag and bobtail of schoolboys and golf caddies and hobbledy hoys when i went out of doors threatened with personal violence by stupid people like old lupton who wouldn't understand that a man can't pay what he hasn't got pestered by the wives of various gentlemen who saw fit to become out of works on the strength of alleged injuries and served with all sorts of silly summonses for all sorts of fancy offences such as mischievous mischief and manslaughter and wilful damage and trespass that i simply had to go away from the mintonchester to italy and leave poor little mother to manage them in her own solid undemonstrative way which she did i must admit like a brick they didn't get much out of her anyhow but she had to break up our little home at mintonchester and join me in arosa in spite of her dislike of italian cooking she found me already a bit of a celebrity because i had made a record so it seemed by falling down three separate crevices on three successive days but that's another story altogether from start to finish i reckon that first airplane cost my mother over nine hundred pounds if i hadn't put my foot down and she had stuck to her original intention of paying all the damage it would have cost her three thousand but it was worth it it was worth it i wish i could live it all over again and many an old codger like me sits at home now and deplores those happy vanished adventurous times when any lad of spirit was free to fly and go anywhere and smash anything and discuss the question afterwards of just what the damages amounted to and what his legal liability might be end of my first airplane little mother up the mortarburg by h g wells this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by krista zaleski little mother up the mortarburg i think i mentioned when i was telling how i sailed my first airplane that i made a kind of record at arosa by falling down three separate crevices on three successive days that was before little mother followed me out there when she came i could see at a glance she was tired and jaded and worried and so instead of letting her fret about in the hotel and get into a wearing tangle of gossip i packed her and two knapsacks up and started off on a long refreshing easy-going walk northward until the blister on her foot stranded us at the magna rube hotel on the sneejuk she was for going on blister or no blister i never met pluck like mothers in all my life but i said no this is a mountaineering inn and it suits me down to the ground or if you prefer it up to the sky you shall sit in the veranda by the telescope and i'll prance about among the peaks for a bit don't have accidents she said can't promise that little mother i said but i'll always remember i'm your only son so i pranced i need hardly say that in a couple of days i was up loggerheads with all the mountaineers in that inn they couldn't stand me they didn't like my neck with its strong fine adam's apple being mostly men with their heads jammed on 
and they didn't like the way I bore myself and lifted my aviator's nose to the peaks. They didn't like my being a vegetarian and the way I evidently enjoyed it. And they didn't like the touch of color, orange and green, in my rough serge suit. They were all of the dingy school, the sort of men I call gentlemanly owls, shy, correct-minded creatures, mostly from Oxford, and as solemn over their climbing as a cat frying eggs. Sage they were, great head-nodders, and I wouldn't venture to do a thing like thatters. They always did what the books and guides advised. And they classed themselves by their seasons. One was in his ninth season, another in his tenth, and so on. I was a novice, and had to sit with my mouth open for bits of humble pie. My style, that, rather. I would sit in the smoking-room sucking away at a pipe full of hygienic herb tobacco. They said it smelt like burning garden rubbish and waiting to put my spoke in and let a little light into their minds. They set aside their natural reticence, all together in their efforts to show how much they didn't like me. You chaps take these blessed mountains too seriously, I said. They're larks, and you've got to lark with them. They just slewed their eyes round at me. I don't find the solemn joy in fussing you do. The old-style mountaineers went up with alpenstocks and ladders and light hearts. That's my idea of mountaineering. It isn't ours, said one red-boiled hero of the peaks, all blisters and peeling skin, and he said it with an air of crushing me. It's the right idea, I said serenely, and puffed at my herb tobacco. When you've had a bit of experience, you'll know better, said another, an oldish young man with a small grey beard. Experience never taught me anything, I said. Apparently not, said someone, and left me one down and me to play. I kept perfectly tranquil. I mean to do the Mortarberg before I go down, I said quietly, and produced a sensation. When are you going down? A week or so, I answered, unperturbed. It's not the climb a man ought to attempt in his first year, said the peeling gentleman. You particularly ought not to try it, said another. No guide will go with you. Foolhardy idea. Mere brag. Like to see him do it. I just let them boil for a bit, and when they were back to the simmer I dropped in pensively, with— very likely I'll take that little mother of mine. She's small, bless her, but she's as hard as nails. But they saw they were being drawn by my ill-concealed smile, and this time they contented themselves with a few grunts and grunt-like remarks, and then broke up into little conversations in undertones that pointedly excluded me. It had the effect of hardening my purpose. I'm a stiff man when I'm put on my mettle, and I determined that the little mother should go up to Mortarberg, where half these solemn experts hadn't been, even if I had to be killed or orphaned in the attempt. So I spoke to her about it the next day. She was in a deck-chair on the veranda, wrapped up in rugs and looking at the peaks. Comfy, I said. Very, she said. Getting rested? It's so nice. I strolled to the rail of the veranda. See that peak there, Mummy? She nodded happily with eyes half shut. That's the Mortarberg. You and me have got to be up there the day after tomorrow. Her eyes opened a bit. "'Wouldn't it be rather a climb, dearest?' she said. "'I'll manage that all right,' I said, and she smiled consentingly and closed her eyes. "'So long as you manage it,' she said. I went down the valley that afternoon to Daxdam to get gear and guides and porters, and I spent the next day in glacier and rock practice above the hotel. That didn't add to my popularity. I made two little slips. One took me down a crevice. I have an extraordinary knack of going down crevices and a party of three which was starting for the Kinderspitz spent an hour and a half fishing me out, and the other led to my dropping my ice-axe on a little string of people going for the Humpy Glacier. It didn't go within thirty inches of anyone, but you might have thought from the row they made that I had knocked out the collective brains of the party. Quite frightful language they used, and three ladies with them, too. The next day there was something very like an organized attempt to prevent our start. They brought out the landlord, they remonstrated with mother, they did their best to blacken the character of my two guides. The landlord's brother had a first-class row with them. Two years ago, he said, they lost their hair. No particular reason, I said, why you shouldn't keep yours on, is it? That settled him. He wasn't up to a polyglot pun, and it stuck in his mind like a fishbone in the throat. Then the peeling gentleman came along and tried to overhaul our equipment. Have you got this, it was, and have you got that? Two things, I said, looking at his nose pretty hard. We haven't forgotten. One's blue veils and the other Vaseline. I've still a bright little memory of the start. 
there was the pass a couple of hundred feet or so below the hotel and the hotel all name and windows standing out in a great desolate rocky place against the lumpy masses of streaky green rock flecked here and there with patches of snow and dark shelves of rhododendron and rising perhaps a thousand feet towards the western spur of the massif our path ran before us meandering among the boulders down to stepping stones over a rivulet and then upward on the other side of the stream towards the manganaroo glacier where we had to go up the rocks to the left and then across the ice fall to shelves on the precipitous face on the west side it was dawn the sun still had to rise and everything looked very cold and blue and vast about us every one in the hotel had turned out to bear a hand in the row some of the de habiles were disgraceful and now they stood in a silent group watching us recede the last word i caught was they'll have to come back we'll come back all right i answered never fear and so we went our way cool and deliberate over the stream and up and up towards the steep snowfields and icy shoulder of the mortarberg i remember that we went in absolute silence for a time and then how suddenly the landscape gladdened with sunrise and in an instant as if speech had thawed all our tongues were babbling i had one or two things in the baggage that i hadn't cared for the people at the inn to see and i made no effort to explain why i had five porters with the load of two and a half but when we came to the ice fall i showed my hand a little and unslung a stout twine hammock for the mater we put her in this with a rug round her and sewed her in with a few stitches then we roped up in line with me last but one and a guide front and rear and mummy in the middle carried by two of the porters i stuck my alpenstock through two holes i had made in the shoulders of my jacket under my rucksack t-shaped to my body so that when i went down a crevasse as i did ever and again i just stuck in its jaws and came up easy as the rope grew taut and so except for one or two bumps that made the mater chuckle we got over without misadventure then came the rock climb on the other side requiring much judgment we had to get from ledge to ledge as opportunity offered and here the little mother was a perfect godsend we unpacked her after we had slung her over the big fissure i forget what you call it it always comes between glacier and rock and whenever we came to a bit of ledge within eight feet of the one we were working along the two guides took her and slung her up she being so light and then she was able to give a foot for the next man to hold by and hoist himself she said we were all pulling her leg and that made her and me laugh so much that the whole party had to wait for us it was pretty tiring altogether doing that bit of a climb two hours we had of it before we got to the loose masses of rock at the top of the arete it's worse going down said the elder guide i looked back for the first time and i confess it did make me feel a bit giddy there was the glacier looking quite petty with the black gash between itself and the rocks for a time it was pretty fair going up the rocky edge of the arete and nothing happened of any importance except that one of the porters took to grousing because he was hit on the shin by a stone i dislodged fortunes of war i said but he didn't seem to see it and when i just missed him with a second he broke out into a long whining discourse in what i suppose he thought was german i couldn't make hand or tail of it he says you might have killed him said the little mother they say i quoted what they say let them say i was for stopping and filling him up with a feed but the elder guide wouldn't have it we had already lost time he said and the traverse round the other face of the mountain would be more and more subject to avalanches as the sun got up so we went on as we went round the corner to the other face i turned towards the hotel it was the meanest little oblong spot by now and made a derisive gesture or so for the benefit of any one at the telescope we did get one rock avalanche that reduced the hindmost guide to audible prayer but nothing hit us except a few bits of snow the rest of the fall was a couple of yards and more out from us we were on rock just then and overhung before and afterwards we were edging along steps in an ice slope cut by the foremost guide and touched up by the porters the avalanche was much more impressive before it came in sight banging and thundering overhead and it made a tremendous uproar in the blue deeps beneath but in actual transit it seemed a mean show mostly of stone smaller than i am all right said the guide toned up i answered i suppose it is safe dear asked the little mother safe as trafalgar square i said hop along mummikins which she did with remarkable agility the traverse took us on to old snow at last and here we could rest for lunch and pretty glad we were both of lunch and rest 
but here the trouble with the guides and porters thickened. They were already a little ruffled about my animating way with loose rocks, and now they kicked up a tremendous shindy because instead of the customary brandy we had brought non-alcoholic ginger cordial. Would they even try it? Not a bit of it. It was a queer little dispute, high up in that rarefied air, about food values and the advantages of making sandwiches with nutter. They were an odd lot of men, invincibly set upon a vitiated and vitiating dietary. They wanted meat, they wanted alcohol, they wanted narcotics to smoke. You might have thought that men like these, living in almost direct contact with nature, would have liked nature foods, such as plasmon, protose, plobos, digestine, and so forth. Not them. They just craved for corruption. When I spoke of drinking pure water, one of the porters spat in a marked symbolic manner over the precipice. From that point onward, discontent prevailed. We started again about half-past eleven after a vain attempt on the part of the head guide to induce us to turn back. We had now come to what is generally the most difficult part of the Mordeberg ascent, the edge that leads up to the snowfield below the crest. But here we came suddenly into a draught of warm air blowing from the southwest, and everything, the guide said, was unusual. Usually the edge is a sheet of ice over rock. Today it was wet and soft, and one could kick steps in it and get one's toes into the rock with the utmost care. This is where Herr Tomlinson's party fell, said one of the porters, after we'd committed ourselves to the edge for ten minutes or so. Some people could fall out of a four-post bed, I said. It'll freeze hard again before we come back, said the second guide, and us with nothing but verdamic ginger inside of us. You keep your rope taut, said I. A friendly ledge came to the help of Mother in the nick of time, just as she was beginning to tire, and we sewed her up all but the feet in her hammock again, and roped her carefully. She bumped a bit, and at times she was just hanging over immensity and rotating slowly, with everybody else holding on like grim death. "'My dear,' she said, the first time this happened, "'is it right for me to be doing this?' "'Quite right,' I said. "'But if you can get a foothold presently again, it's rather better style.' "'You're sure there's no danger, dear? Not a scrap. And I don't fatigue you. You're a stimulant. The view,' she said, "'is certainly becoming very beautiful.' But presently the view blotted itself out, and we were in clouds and a thin drift of almost thawing snowflakes. We reached the upper snowfield about half-past one, and the snow was extraordinarily soft. The elder guide went in up to his armpits. "'Frog it,' I said and spread myself out flat in a sort of swimming attitude, so we bored our way up to the crest and along it. We went in little spurts, and then we stopped for breath, and we dragged the little mother after us in her hammock bag. Sometimes the snow was so good we fairly skimmed the surface. Sometimes it was so rotten we plunged right into it and splashed about. I went too near the snow cornice once, and it broke open under me, but the rope saved me, and we reached the summit about three o'clock without further misadventure. The summit was just bare rock with the usual cairn and pole. Nothing to make a fuss about. The drift of snow and cloud wisp had passed, the sun was blazing hot overhead, and we seemed to be surveying all Switzerland. The Megan Rube Hotel was at our toes, hidden, so to speak, by our chins. We squatted about the cairn, and the guides and porters were reduced to ginger and vegetarian ham sandwiches. I cut and scratched an inscription saying I had climbed on simple food and claiming a record. Seen from the summit, the snowfields on the northeast side of the mountain looked extremely attractive, and I asked the head guide why that way up wasn't used. He said something in his peculiar German about precipices. So far, our ascent had been a fairly correct ascent in rather slow time. It was in the descent that the strain in me of almost unpremeditated originality had play. I wouldn't have the rope returning across the upper snowfield, because Mother's feet and hands were cold and I wanted her to jump about a bit. And before I could do anything to prevent it, she had slipped, tried to get up by rolling over down the slope instead of up, as she ought to have done, and was leading the way, rolling over and over and over, down towards the guide's blessed precipices above the lower snowfield. I didn't lose an instant in flinging myself after her, axe up, in glissading attitude. I'm not clear what I meant to do, but I fancy the idea was to get in front of her and put on the brake. I did not succeed, anyhow. In twenty seconds I had slipped, 
and was sitting down and going down out of my own control altogether. Now most great discoveries are the result of accident, and I maintain that in that instant Mother and I discovered two distinct and novel ways of coming down a mountain. It is necessary that there should be first a snow slope, above with a layer of softish rotten snow on the top of ice, then a precipice, with a snow-covered talus sloping steeply at first and then less steeply, then more snow slopes and precipices according to taste, ending in a snow field or a not too greatly fissured glacier, or a reasonable not too rocky slope. Then it all becomes as easy as shooting the chutes. Mother hit on the sideways method. She rolled. With the snow in the adhesive state it had got into, she had made the jolliest little snowball of herself in half a minute, and the nucleus of as clean and abundant a snow avalanche as any one could wish. There was plenty of snow going in front of her, and that's the very essence of both our methods. You must fall on your snow, not your snow on you, or it smashes you, and you mustn't mix yourself up with the loose stones. I, on the other hand, went down feet first, and rather like a snowplow, slower than she did, and if perhaps with less charm, with more dignity. Also I saw more. But it was certainly a tremendous rush and I gave a sort of gulp when Mummy bumped over the edge into the empty air and vanished. It was like a toboggan ride gone mad down the slope, until I took off from the edge of the precipice, and then it was like a dream. I'd always thought falling must be horrible. It wasn't in the slightest degree. I might have hung with my clouds and lumps of snow about me for weeks, so great was my serenity. I had an impression then that I was as good as killed, and that it didn't matter. I wasn't afraid. That's nothing. But I wasn't a bit uncomfortable. Whack! We'd hit something, and I expected to be flying to bits right and left. But we'd only got on to the snow slope below, at so steep an angle that it was merely breaking the fall. Down we went again. I didn't see much of the view after that, because the snow was all round and over my head. But I kept feet foremost, and in a kind of sitting posture and then I slowed, and then I quickened again, and bumped rather, and then harder, and bumped, and then bumped again, and came to rest. This time I was altogether buried in snow, and twisted sideways with a lot of heavy snow on my right shoulder. I sat for a bit, enjoying the stillness, and then I wondered what had become of Mother, and set myself to get out of the snow about me. It wasn't so easy as you might think. The stuff was all in lumps and spaces like a gigantic sponge, and I lost my temper and struggled and swore a great deal, but at last I managed it. I crawled out and found myself on the edge of heaped masses of snow, quite close to the upper part of the Meganru Glacier, and far away, right up the glacier and near the other side, was a little thing like a black beetle struggling in the heart of an immense split ball of snow. I put my hands to my mouth and let out with my version of the yodel, and presently I saw her waving her hand. It took me nearly twenty minutes to get to her. I knew my weakness, and I was very careful of every crevice I came near. When I got up to her, her face was anxious. "'What have you done with the guides?' she asked. "'They've got too much to carry,' I said. "'They're coming down another way. Did you like it?' "'Not very much, dear,' she said. "'But I dare say I shall get used to these things. Which way do we go now?' I decided we'd find a snow bridge across the Bergschrund. That's the word I forgot just now. And so get on to the rocks on the east side of the glacier. And after that, we had an uneventful going right down to the hotel. Our return evoked such a strain of hostility and envy as I have never met before or since. First, they tried to make out we'd never been to the top at all. But Mother's little proud voice settled that sort of insult. And besides, there was the evidence of the guides and the porters following us down. When they asked about the guides, they're following your methods, I said, and I suppose they'll get back here tomorrow morning some when. That didn't please them. I claimed a record. They said my methods were illegitimate. If I see fit, I said, to use an avalanche to get back by, what's that to you? You tell me me and mother can't do the confounded mountain anyhow, and when we do, you want to invent a lot of rules to disqualify us. You'll say next one mustn't glissade. I've made a record. And you know I've made a record, and you're about as sour as you can be. The fact of it is, you chaps don't know your own silly business. Here's a good, quick way of coming down a mountain, and you ought to know about it. 
the chance that both of you are not killed was one in a thousand. Nonsense! It's the proper way to come down for anyone who hasn't a hide-bound mind. You chaps ought to practice falling great heights in snow. It's perfectly easy and perfectly safe, if only you know how to set about it. Look here, young man, said the oldest young man with the little grey beard. You don't seem to understand that you and that lady have been saved by a kind of miracle. Theory, I interrupted. I'm surprised you fellows ever come to Switzerland. If I were your kind, I'd just invent theoretical mountains and play for points. However, you're tired, little mummy. It's time you had some nice warm soup and tucked yourself up in bed. I shan't let you get up for six and thirty hours. But it's queer how people detest a little originality. End of Little Mother Up the Mortarburg The Pearl of Love by H. G. Wells This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Krista Zaleski The Pearl of Love The pearl is lovelier than the most brilliant of crystalline stones, the moralist declares, because it is made through the suffering of a living creature. About that I can say nothing, because I feel none of the fascination of pearls. Their cloudy luster moves me not at all. Nor can I decide for myself upon that age-long dispute whether the pearl of love is the cruelest of stories, or only a gracious fable of the immortality of beauty. Both the story and the controversy will be familiar to students of medieval Persian prose. The story is a short one, though the commentary upon it is a respectable part of the literature of that period. They have treated it as a poetic invention, and they have treated it as an allegory meaning this, that, or the other thing. Theologians have had their copious way with it, dealing with it particularly as concerning the restoration of the body after death, and it has been greatly used as a parable by those who write about aesthetics. And many have held it to be the statement of a fact, simply and baldly true. The story is laid in North India, which is the most fruitful soil for sublime love stories of all the lands in the world. It was in a country of sunshine and lakes and rich forests and hills and fertile valleys, and far away the great mountains hung in the sky, peaks, crests, and ridges of inaccessible and eternal snow. There was a young prince, lord of all the land, and he found a maiden of indescribable beauty and delightfulness, and he made her his queen and laid his heart at her feet. Love was theirs, full of joys and sweetness, full of hope, exquisite, brave, and marvellous love. Beyond anything you have ever dreamt of love, it was theirs for a year and a part of a year, and then suddenly, because of some venomous sting that came to her in a thicket, she died. She died, and for a while the prince was utterly prostrated. He was silent and motionless with grief. They feared he might kill himself, and he had neither sons nor brothers to succeed him. For two days and nights he lay upon his face, fasting across the foot of the couch which bore her calm and lovely body. Then he arose and ate, and went about very quietly like one who has taken a great resolution. He caused her body to be put in a coffin of lead mixed with silver, and for that he had an outer coffin made of the most precious scented woods wrought with gold, and about that there was to be a sarcophagus of alabaster, inlaid with precious stones. And while these things were being done, he spent his time for the most part by the pools, and in the garden-houses and pavilions and groves, and in those chambers in the palace where they two had been most together, brooding upon her loveliness. He did not rend his garments, nor defile himself with ashes and sackcloth, as the custom was, for his love was too great for such extravagances. At last he came forth again among his counsellors, and before the people, and told them what he had a mind to do. He said he could never more touch a woman, he could never more think of them, and so he would find a seemly youth to adopt for his heir, and train him to his task, and that he would do his princely duties as became him, but that for the rest of it he would give himself with all his power and all his strength and all his wealth, all that he could command, to make a monument worthy of his incomparable dear lost mistress, a building it should be of perfect grace and beauty, more marvellous than any other building had ever been nor could ever be, so that to the end of time it should be a wonder, and men would treasure it and speak of it and desire to see it, and come from all the lands of the earth to visit it, and recall the name and the memory of his queen 
and this building he said was to be called the pearl of love and this his counsellors and people permitted him to do and so he did year followed year and all the years he devoted himself to building and adorning the pearl of love a great foundation was hewn out of the living rock in a place whence one seemed to be looking at the snowy wilderness of the great mountain across the valley of the world villages and hills there were a winding river and very far away three great cities here they put the sarcophagus of alabaster beneath a pavilion of cunning workmanship and about it there were set pillars of strange and lovely stone and wrought and fretted walls and a great casket of masonry bearing a dome and pinnacles and cupolas as exquisite as a jewel at first the design of the pearl of love was less bold and subtle than it became later at first it was smaller and more wrought and encrusted there were many pierced screens and delicate clusters of rosy-hued pillars and the sarcophagus lay like a child that sleeps among flowers the first dome was covered with green tiles framed and held together by silver but this was taken away again because it seemed close because it did not soar grandly enough for the broadening imagination of the prince for by this time he was no longer the graceful youth who had loved the girl queen he was now a man grave and intent wholly set upon the building of the pearl of love with every year of effort he had learnt new possibilities in arch and wall and buttress he had acquired greater power over the material he had to use and he had learnt of a hundred stones and hues and effects that he could never have thought of in the beginning his sense of colour had grown finer and colder he cared no more for the enamelled gold-lined brightness that had pleased him first the brightness of an illuminated missile he sought now for the blue colourings like the sky and for the subtle hues of great distances for recondite shadows and sudden broad floods of purple opalescence and for grandeur and space he wearied altogether of carvings and pictures and inlaid ornamentation and all the little careful work of men those were pretty things he said of his earlier decorations and had them put aside into subordinate buildings where they would not hamper his main design greater and greater grew his artistry with awe and amazement the people saw the pearl of love sweeping up from its first beginnings to a superhuman breadth and height and magnificence they did not know clearly what they had expected but never had they expected so sublime a thing as this wonderful are the miracles they whispered that love can do and all the women in the world whatever the other loves they had loved the prince for the splendour of his devotion through the middle of the building ran a great aisle a vista that the prince came to care for more and more from the inner entrance of the building he looked along the length of an immense pillared gallery and across the central area from which the rose-hued columns had long since vanished over the top of the pavilion under which lay the sarcophagus through a marvellously designed opening to the snowy wildernesses of the great mountain the lord of all mountains two hundred miles away the pillars and arches and buttresses and galleries soared and floated on either side perfect yet unobtrusive like great archangels waiting in the shadows about the presence of god when men saw that austere beauty for the first time they were exalted and then they shivered and their hearts bowed down very often would the prince come to stand there and look at that vista deeply moved and not yet fully satisfied the pearl of love had still something for him to do he felt before his task was done always he would order some little alteration to be made or some recent alteration to be put back again and one day he said that the sarcophagus would be clearer and simpler without the pavilion and after regarding it very steadfastly for a long time he had the pavilion dismantled and removed the next day he came and said nothing and the next day and the next then for two days he stayed away altogether then he returned bringing with him an architect and two master craftsmen and a small retinue all looked standing together silently in a little group amidst the serene vastness of their achievement no trace of toil remained in its perfection it was as if the god of nature's beauty had taken over their offspring to himself only one thing there was to mar the absolute harmony there was a certain disproportion about the sarcophagus it had never been enlarged and indeed how could it have been enlarged since the early days it challenged the eye it nicked the streaming lines in that sarcophagus was the casket of lead and silver and in the casket of lead and silver was the queen the dear immortal cause of all this beauty but now that sarcophagus seemed no more than a little dark oblong that lay incongruously in the great vista of the pearl of love 
It was as if someone had dropped a small valise upon the crystal sea of heaven. Long the prince mused, but no one knew the thoughts that passed through his mind. At last he spoke. He pointed. Take that thing away, he said. End of the Pearl of Love